ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the Kill Stream. I am your host, Ethan Ralph, the owner and the editor in chief of the RalphRetort.com. There I am. There's the three view. Here comes the double view. They're already talking. You can't hear him just yet. There's logo. Let me switch over. So usually we have the special layout with the debate and me in the middle, but there's four people, so I, I didn't really think that. Would, I didn't know if that would work right. Um, so we're gonna switch between the three view and the double view here. All right, now let me unmute the tab. Logo's coughing like I just was a minute ago right before we came on air. <laughs> all right, now. Corona, uh, I'm not right, sure, though. All right, now now we can hear you. Hopefully it's <sighs> not Corona. Um, speaking of Corona, Biden gave his speech earlier. We covered that at the end of Tequila Sunrise. If you want to check that out, it'll be on killstream.tv later. Okay, you know what? Let's just jump right into it. Uh, I know everybody's got their own scheduling and stuff like that, so... Logo, you were talking. Uh, we're going to do five minute uh, introductions here. I dubbed it as a as the fascism debate, although it's a little, you know, yeah, more. more oh, so am I up? Am I talking? Yeah, I now? figured why not? I have the floor. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that what the debate's supposed to be about. I think there were two subjects. The mm. first one would be whether or not we would define uh, China under Xi Jinping as fascist. I don't think that really makes sense um, as a discussion topic because it's going to come down to like just fucking arbitrary definition games and for me to go with like the communist party calls itself communist it is communist it's called itself communist for like almost 100 years it's the oldest communist party that's still in existence and governs the state i don't see any reason not to call them what they call themselves it seems pretty simple to me um and i think it's like justifiable in all ways uh the other one was regarding whether or not capitalists funded fascists during world war ii or like their movement leading up to it i think capitalists personally funded pretty much all sides because capitalists tend to like to hedge their bets so they uh they invest in pretty much everything you know i mean this is something donald trump would say right where he's like if you're a capitalist you fund all political parties because you're going to need all of them at some point so i don't really see that also is like a, that interesting of a debate considering like the communists were also funded by some capitalists at some times and it, uh, it all goes down to minutia. So I'm more interested in having a discussion with these guys because I think that we have similar ways of looking at things in some respects, but we have some other disagreements, which we'll probably get into. I think we could have a pro uh, productive discussion. Um, I don't really know debates. Debates seem to me kind of um, like spectacle and like a farce, and uh, they don't seem to produce much of value. So that's my opening statement, I guess. All right. Well, we'll just stick with your side, and then we'll go to the other. Go ahead. Uh, Infrahaz, you've never been on the show. Logo actually has been on the show uh, a while back. Um, why don't you go ahead and put your side out there? Uh, I'm Haas. I'm from the Infrared Collective. We run the Infrared YouTube channel, and we're at on Twitch at twitch.tv slash infrared show. Um, we call ourselves a platform for Marxism-Leninism in the age of multipolarity and the post-COVID world. And so specifically as it concerns this uh, debate, I think the way I want to approach this is pretty much from two levels. Um, one, I think the discussion or the debate about the character of China has to rest upon a specific assumption about the relationship between content and form and appearance and essence. Now, Marxism itself, having grounded itself in a specific um, ontology or metaphysics of the materialist dialectic, recognizes there's a contradiction between content and form. There is no fixed doctrine that premises the development of uh, reality. And Marxism is just an index of the recognition of this fact. Um, if we assume that content and form are one and the same, then as a matter of fact, uh, we would have to concede that there is no possible way we could call it, uh, China, which is governed by a communist party, governed by people, uh, ruled by people who call themselves uh, Marxists and communists, who describe the system in which they live as uh, communists. This is the form. We cannot say the essence of this form is fascist, because this would imply there's a contradiction between uh, appearance and essence. But that same very contradiction is the object of Marxism itself. And on the other hand, um, uh, if we are also not permitted to describe fascism beyond what fascist intellectuals have described of their own uh, theory and ideas and uh, so-called doctrine, then it doesn't make sense that we would assume there's a deeper essence to Chinese Marxism beyond what's already on the surface. So I detect a contradiction in these two facets of the debate between whether fascism was in fact liberalism uh, in crisis and in an emergency mode, um, which obviously contradicts what, what fascist intellectuals themselves said about it. And on the other hand, the question of whether China 
uh, is fascist, despite Chinese Marxists and intellectuals uh, never describing, uh, or the overwhelming majority of Chinese intellectuals at least, never describing their own system and their own uh, country as fascist. So to me, I think the debate will have to revolve around uh, developing and addressing this specific contradiction between form and content. All right, Mr. Woods, Keith Woods, go ahead. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that line of argument. I'm interested to hear where Haz goes with that, but I think uh, we can look at the history of fascism. We can look at what fascist theorists believed and how they governed, and we can uh, single out fascism as a class of developmental nationalism with specific characteristics. And I think when we look at China, I don't think it's good enough to say that the, you know, the CCP still identifies as communists, that they still consider themselves to be carrying on a lineage that includes Marx and Lenin and Mao and so on. I mean, you know, the United States claims to be the ultimate bastion of freedom and liberty, but I don't think anyone here is is uh, going to agree with that exactly. Um, I think it's a, I mean, I think it's important uh, in terms of you know where we're going. I mean, everyone. On this, I think we have large agreements in terms of the direction of things. I mean, I saw Haz the other day was kind of defending a kind of national populist position that I wouldn't really disagree with so much. But I think uh, the Marxist baggage uh, kind of hinders things. And I don't think it's a good model to explain China's success or to map onto other countries that are attempting to kind of uh, navigate this sort of post-colonial direction that I think has things we're going in. As far as fascists being funded by capitalists, I mean, you can say, yeah, every side is funded by capitalists, but the historical record is quite clear on this. I mean, there's some books that amount to conspiracy theories like Conjure and Hitler that try and piece together stuff that isn't there. But if you look at the really respected historians in this, like Henry Ashby Turner, there's wide-ranging agreement that the fascist movements were largely funded by uh, small business owners, the unemployed, um, uh, people in rural areas. There was no real big business support to speak of. There was a couple of industrialists that briefly supported Hitler. We can get into that later. One of them was later put in Dachau concentration camp. And really, I think they're going to repeat a lot of... Um, Marxist mythology about fascism that came out of the communist Comintern in the 20s and 30s, where communists were rushing to explain what was going on with their preconceived notions, but most of these theories didn't look at empirical facts at all. Um, so, yeah, I'll pass it over to Joel. Go ahead, Joel. Joel Davis, by the way, first time on the show as well. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, so from what I said before about, uh, well, you know, we can't tell Marxists what Marxism is because if we say that, uh, you know, Marxists can't tell fascists what fascism is, I feel like this is BS. Like this, this is the truth. Uh, and that's just ideological nonsense. Like uh, the truth is the truth. So someone's got to be right. I mean, maybe both are wrong, but we can't both be right because uh, they're totally incompatible positions. So that's why this needs to be a debate. Um, uh Anyway, so I think there's probably no notion more integral to Marxist thought than the assertion that you know material historical analysis is kind of integral to theorizing the political, right? So like for Marx, this means that the mode of production by which humanity generates the means of its own survival is the basis of all social and political structure. And I think this is correct, like when stated like this, but I think Marxism's fundamental flaw is uh, its reduction of the, pr of the production of the means of life uh, to its economic aspect. And as a consequence, it reduces the social and the political to the economic. And I think if you reject this reduction, you have to kind of reject the Marxist theoretical reduction of the state to the role of a mere enforcer of class domination in response to antagonisms between between economic classes. And this ruptures like the entire theory of Marxism. Like you do, like the, you can't patch it together once you make that that call. So it's a big question. The concrete material historical reality of politics and economics, uh, you know, yes. Obviously, economics plays a role, but it also takes place within geography and the institutional capacity of political orders to secure themselves against internal and external enemies is an organizational question which transcends many economic factors and is also material historical. And these conditions forced both the Bolsheviks and the CCP to take actions which violated, in my view, their Marxist-Leninist ideological priors. And we can get into that a bit later. Um, but when we look at like the Russian and Chinese revolutions themselves, we can see in both cases that the revolutions only occurred because they 
uh, seize opportunities that were induced by politically destabilizing conflicts between dominant economic and political classes. In both cases, you have the landed gentry and the monarchy, uh, monarchies respectively. And, and this conflict was both cases a result of, not of economic antagonism, uh, but the geopolitical pressure that uh, inducing a kind of political antagonism between organizational requirements of the state's internal and external security, impacting the interests of the dominant economic class, and this provoked the gentry in both cases to support challenging and deposing the Romanov and Manchu dynasties respectively. And this in turn created power vacuums, which the Bolsheviks and CCP respectively capitalize upon. Now, class obviously played a role in these revolutions. There's obviously uh, like I'm not negating class completely, but they are complex historical events that are irreducible to the mere economic dynamics of class. And we see direct evidence for this with states like Japan or Prussia, which transitioned from feudalism to industrial capitalism without you know, requisite social revolutions, nuking their monarchies and communist parties taking over. So there's contingency in history that needs to be explained. Um, and I, I bring all this up because uh, the first point of my argument is that China might be ideologically Marxist, but it's not material his, uh, materially historically Marxist, I would argue. And in fact, nothing is because Marxism fails to accurately theorize material history. And the assertion that it is Marxist is pure abstraction, pure ideology. It has no relation to concrete reality. Um, and that kind of betrays the Marxist project fundamentally, you know. Um, and the material historical reality of the contemporary Chinese state, however, I think bears far closer resemblance to fascism or national socialism. And this is precisely because both these ideologies rejected Marxism's economic reductionism in favor of a geopolitical conception of the state's responsibilities, which justify the very state-led, pragmatic, developmentalist economic model that we see in contemporary China, as well as the CCP's promotion of nationalist socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, China is so successful, in my view, precisely because Marx was wrong about the state. States aren't reducible to class antagonism, and this is why states like China and Hitler's Germany could subordinate the economic sphere to a national idea and politically administer collaboration between economic classes. And we see this contradiction of Marx expressed in uh, contemporary CCP ideology with doctrines like the Three Represents, which is an emulation of Mussolini's heretical rejection of the Marxist doctrine of class struggle. And so when Reddit Marxists proclaim that you know China isn't real Marxism, I think they're right because there is no real Marxism in practice. It's simply impossible to practice a theory which is so fundamentally flawed. Lord. Um, but real national socialism has been tried and it's the most effective political system modernity has ever produced. And this is why the CCP are the most successful government on the planet right now, in my view. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. All right. Now, uh, I'm going to let you guys just get right into it. Now, one of the features of the Killstream debates is the questioning of each other. Uh, and especially on a topic like this, not my forte necessarily, uh, although I know a little bit about a little bit. But uh, you guys were already into this su subject, basically arguing amongst yourselves. I brought it to the kill stream, uh, so I see no reason to to kind of stop that. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and start with Keith. If you have any um, like debate points you want to start with here, or like uh, critiques of of the other side's position that you would like to like kind of begin the program with, or or Joel, y'all y'all side, you know, it's a it's kind of a tag team affair. Well, I'd just start with maybe getting some agreement on definitions. And I guess I'd ask uh, Infrared or Logo what their definition of socialism is, because I think this is going to come up a lot later on when they try to say that fascism was a form of capitalism. Well, the way I see it is uh, there isn't a country in the world that isn't socialist right now. Like socialism sort of like a word like democracy, where pretty much every single... Well, I don't know. Are there any states that don't justify themselves on a democratic line of some sort at this point? Um, I think socialism was like the result of like fundamentally it was like a global revolution that happened at the end of the uh, 19th century. And um, I think like, you know, America has been a socialist country for just as long as everywhere else. So I, I, I think that socialism is just like the state of things as they are now. I think uh, we actually, the Infrared Collective, we produced a number of videos on the question of the essence of socialism. And the basic idea is that socialism must be um, understood and defined within the context of the loss of sociality, this common object that is the uh, object of common civilization, statehood, uh, culture, and so on and so on. Some uh, common sociality, which in uh, pre uh, basically the history following from then. And then we can trace, for example, the modern financial institutions and so on that really are uh, kind of the heart of 21st century capitalism or whatever survives of it. They, you can actually trace their lineage back uh, to this uh, historical period. 
Um, yeah. So I think when we say, for example, I've put up for this idea too, that, you know, we can also say America is socialist. Uh, one has to think dialectically. We're not necessarily saying that capitalism has completely been uh, eliminated and capitalism is gone, but that capitalism has kind of reduced its real basis to the kind of uh, vestigial, institutional, and superstructural form of um, essentially, already essentially socialistic uh, mode of production. Yeah, um, I mean, like, the thing is, is that, like, our modern financial system was created by socialists. Like, if, if we're talking about, like, hedge funds managing people's pensions and shit like that, like, what we, basically how everything works in America, that is, uh, that was developed by socialists to be, as, like, a way of restraining um, like capitalists were basically like they were like destroying people's pension funds and things like this. This was like a major this was causing like major economic crashes and shit throughout the 20th century. So like the development of like Bretton Woods system and all that stuff. This is all done by people who called themselves socialists. I mean, Carnegie, yeah, sure. But I mean, these guys all called themselves socialists. So, like, yeah, sure. I but I mean, there is some sense. Socialism. There is some sense in which we can say China is socialist in a way that the U.S. isn't and the U.S. is a capitalist country. I mean, I, I agree. Think, yeah. Yeah, and I've heard yeah, a definition yeah, from Haas sure. before that I'd agree with, where I think Haas said that socialism is the mode of production directed toward a social end. That's maybe a little bit ambiguous, but I think we can agree that... It still seems so state, tautological to me, though. It's like, oh, like, yeah, socialism is so... Yeah, like, so what do you mean? Think, like, it's like, it's like, it's like the yeah. definition is so broad, it's, I like, think, meaningless. Well, well, the thing is, is that I think that, like, the use of a definition, right, is, like, how much it brings, like, coherence or clarity to the world. So when yeah. I say something like uh, every state in the world right now is socialist, I think that does actually, like, transfer some meaningful information, and it does lay a groundwork for how so we So, to, to be clear, I would communism actually, would be yeah. the overcoming so, of he, he, the thing, right? I have made many arguments before about the limitations of definitions and uh, the Anglo box and so on. So I have made a simple definition of socialism. If you're not satisfied with the definition, just ask for clarification and I can uh, elaborate. I'm, more, I'm kind of interested in, um, yeah. do you consider China to be communist or is it like, because I mean, from what I can tell, like the CCP seems to say, well, no, we're, 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 we're a socialist this, country. Yeah. We're on our way to communism. It might take a hundred years. This, and like, how would you define communism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how do we know when it's here? Because yeah, yeah. do you take I can, Marxist I, definition or do you, do you I disagree can, I can with answer Marxist? This, I can answer this question. Um, so there's two senses of the word communism that are used by communist parties. One is a society that has um, already been set, as Marx put it, um, on its basis of a communistic mode of production. A society so thoroughly transformed by the process of communism that it is an entirely, like it is a mode of production entirely distinct from the old one. It doesn't have the kind of birthmarks of the old mode of production, so to speak. And then in the other sense is communism as a world historical force, which is actually how Marx uh, described it. Marx said, by communism, we do not mean an ideal with uh, society will have to conform itself to, but the real movement which sublates the present state of things. So in the sense of that Marx put it as the real movement, yes, China's communist, but in the sense of um, how Chinese Marxists conceive of, you know, the different stages of socialism and a communist mode of production, a, com a society so thoroughly transformed uh, by this process that, for example, money has become eliminated, um, uh, the kind of principle of from each according to their ability to each according to their need prevails, uh, superabundance, um, the ad advanced development of the forces of production to the point of um, the complete elimination of want and so on and so on. That is... Uh, they it's like Star Trek. I, I really hate that example. <laughs> you know, I think no, because, because, uh, because what, I, what, what, I, what I don't yeah. get, because like from reading Marx, he seems it, it's it, like obviously Marx uh, develops his thought a lot throughout his career, but he has early on he has this co concept of species being this idea that like within us we have this natural proclivity to do whatever the fuck we want. I want to play guitar. I want to go build a house. I want to fish. I want to read a book. Mm -hmm. And then and then and then capitalism forces us to do some like repetitive process like if we're no, like some so, proletarian uh, it's like proletarian in a factory yeah, just, yeah. Uh, so to, to clarify and, and, and yeah. this and this alienates us from uh, our kind of inherent uh like our inherent nature to kind of actualize ourselves in the world 
Um, and the goal of communism would be ultimately this kind of uh, you, like almost like utopic notion, uh, it seems like, of, of self-actualization. It's what you get from Marx's early writing, at least, when he's talking so about his critique there, of alienation. There's two, just really quick, two important things I want to clarify. Actually, it's Marx's humanism, species being, that we derive the unique Marxist view of socialism. So when we say mode of production for social ends, these social ends are the determinate form of humanity so far as the socialistic country or society is concerned. It's the specific type of human being uh, whose needs and wants must be addressed at some kind of collective uh, level, whose baseline standard of living and dignity and sense of uh, ownership and stake in the economy and so on. And then the second thing um, regarding this, what you're talking about is Marx's description of the division of labor. So Marx's point is not that as human beings we have the um, proclivity to be whimsical about the thing, different things we do that as if like our different mode of activity in life is not rational it's just completely based on arbitrary individual whim and then from this misinterpretation you get tendencies like falc fully automated luxury communism or communism means no one works we just do what we want and so on but Marx's point is not so much about doing what, whatever we want as so much as it is about the way in which the division of labor interpolates us and forces us to be one. Uh, for example, Marx says, I can fish in the afternoon. Uh, I don't forget what he specifically says, work in the evening and then write in the, the morning or something without, and this is the important part, without ever becoming a fisherman, a writer, uh, or a craftsman. So Marx's point is not the like freedom to just do whatever you want whimsically, but human activity no longer um, human activity developing uh, in a way that is in accordance with the inherent and latent abilities of human beings, uh, which of course will differ across uh, different people, different individuals, and so on and so on. Um, but Marx's underlying point is uh, about the division of labor. It's about the way labor um, uh, is given a fixed form. The form of labor becomes fixed and is no longer allowed to uh, develop as human labor as such, if that makes sense. I don't know. It just seems like... Uh... It seems kind of retarded to me because, I mean, and this gets to what I was saying in my original statement about, you know, um, the material historical reality of, of geopolitics, the uh, material historical reality of institutions and organization and the political. Um, and uh, this idea that, like, economic relations is, like, the driving force behind history, it just seems like a BS to me. Like, if you look, take the example of the Soviet Union, and you look at um, like the Russian Revolution. You look at uh, Lenin in, in, in State and Revolution. He's talking about well, you know we're going to abolish um, bureau bureaucratized militaries. We're going to have we're, we're going to have this uh, you know the workers are going to run the factories. They're going to have their own arms. We're not going to and then uh, they but then the reality and I think Lenin believes this. Uh, Chomsky says Lenin's bullshitting to get in power, and then he really had this like nefarious plan. I think he actually believed this stuff. Well, it, and then when, uh, and then when, but when the when they actually take power, then the cold hard reality of what it means to run a state actually comes upon them. And then when this happens, uh, they have to go to what they called war communism, so to speak, where okay, we've got to bureaucratize everything, create this giant red army with millions and millions of people, some of which were they literally forced peasants into the army um, and to, to fight the counter revolution. And then uh, you know, then after they win the they they put down the counter revolution, they go okay, we can take the boot off the neck a little bit of the peasants and and the working class now, um, and we can have you know the new economic policy or whatever, and uh, things start kind of normalizing. Lenin dies, Stalin comes to power, and they go well, wait a second, like we got our ass handed to us in the first world war. If we don't sort our shit out, the next time we go to war with we, the, we should the rein in power, we should rein in it a little bit because this is going in many many different branches. No, just let, let me finish my point because I, okay. I, I, I'm going to land and then I want to hear what you're going to say. So Stalin comes to power and he's faced with a choice that's an it, it, incredibly difficult choice, which is I can either abuse the fuck out of my population, but maybe when we go to war with Germany or, or Japan or whatever, we win. Or I can not abuse my population, and then when we go to war, we can get our ass handed to us. And Stalin takes the decision, and I don't envy Stalin. 
he takes the decision, okay, I'm going to abuse the fuck out of my population. I'm going to go collectivize the, the peasants' farms. I'm going to force them into brutal working conditions. I'm going to militarize uh, the, the, the production, and then we're going to do this crazy industrialization process. And you know what? It worked. They fucking beat the Nazis, right? But the cost, how many people went to gulags? How many people got shot? Like millions of people died in order to, to, to sacrifice to get that done. And this to me is reality. This, this uh, fanciful BS in Marx about communism, this is just nonsense. And well, when you I, say that yeah, China he, is, uh, is communist, I don't yeah. see it. I see, I see well, China I think, as, I think, as a very competent yeah. state. Well, I, th- but I, I think, don't. yeah, the issue here, though, is that we have made a lot of particular concrete assumptions on the basis of a very, very broad uh, and I may say very reckless kind of view of the the history you just described. So point by point, I'll try to just address what you said based on what I remembered. The first thing I remember you saying th- before you said the thing about war communism. What did you say first initially? That you think it's I was talking about Lenin. Because... I was talking about Lenin's state and revolution. Oh, okay, okay, uh... okay. So that's yeah. where you began. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Lenin's state and the revolution may have. Um, the actual folding of history may have, I guess, um, made his expectations more realistic, but the way you've described it is just uh, plainly not true. So the expectation of very uh, intellectuals and artistic classes and cultural classes that, oh, yes, we're going to have the revolution, we're going to be very generous about abolishing higher... Well, I think most Bolsheviks at the time would consider this a kind of ultra-left deviation. It's kind of a dizziness of the success of the revolution. The fact of the matter is that the Bolsheviks, I mean, you have to understand that people you're talking about, these were hardened people who understood the cold, sobering realities uh, of life more than anyone uh, else at their time. They were in Siberian camps. They were professional revolutionaries. So these are not uh, soft snowflakes who are just you know, faced with harsh, cruel uh, realities. People, the leading Bolsheviks, people like Lenin, always understood these realities to be harsh uh, from the very beginning. So war communism was not some drastic... Lenin understood that the proletarian dictatorship was the dictatorship of one class against another. This is before he seized power. They had no uh, delusional expectations that they were going to seize power and immediately create... um, a nice communist society. And I think you've misinterpreted the meaning of Marx's words here. You've made a lot of assumptions about, you know, like the process Marx is describing uh, to arrive at this fund that would arrive, not to, it's a very important distinction, that would arrive. Uh, I don't think I'm misunderstanding anything. I mean, you you haven't explained to me how... Well, I'll get there. You haven't responded responded to my uh, critique of economic reductionism, for one. Okay, yeah, yeah, that was the first thing you said. I'll get there. Hmm. I just want to talk again about the, the Stalin thing you mentioned. You said Stalin was going to treat his own population like shit. Um... Although the collectivization resulted in a catastrophic famine, as all forms of the modernization of agriculture across the entire history of humanity have, and compared to those, that the ones that happened in Europe and the human costs of European modernization, all of the deaths uh, combined of China and the Soviet Union are extremely modest um, in in terms of their brutality and violence and so on and so on. So I don't think we should bring this up uh, and repeat these kind of black legends Uh, when it has no explanatory value. The fact of the matter is that the path Stalin pursued of socialism in one country and the industrialization, first of all, was not based on the militarization of agriculture. This was Trotsky's plan for super-industrialization. Stalin's plan for the, or not Stalin's, it wasn't his specific plan, but the promotion of the collective farm as a model for the industrialization of uh, the economy so that uh, agriculture can finally support uh, the industrialization of the Soviet Union. Um, This was not the militarization. The collective farms had uh, a a good degree of autonomy compared to the top-down state solkosis and the institutions that were directly controlled by the state. So this is just patently not true. Now, the question of economic reductionism is also a, misinter- a misunderstanding. You are assuming that Marxism is a kind of metaphysics in which we explain the world before us in terms of some kind of absolute essence. And you think that this essence is the economic relations. But the significance of economic relations as it concerns Marx uh, and Engels is not as some kind of um, fundamental substance of all reality. 
but as uh, the S, the deeper essence, in a sense of an essence that is not already superimposed with a specific form. So to be clear by what that means, Marx and Engels acknowledge all of the spiritual, geopolitical, political, and so on realities. They are not substituting those realities for economic relations. They are just saying, what is the manner by which these realities actually, in real reality, how do they actually reproduce themselves? Like, how do they actually, you can even look at this from a kind of perspective of Aristotel, Aristotelian metaphysics, like how are they actually being? How are they actually reproducing their existence? And all have they have done is introduced this question for the first time in the examination of history, where historians, as they noted, had always ignored this question. How is it that human beings really do reproduce themselves in a given historical epoch um we shouldn't and they're saying we're not going to just reduce this to the ideas and uh, the things that they have and the ways that they're conceptualizing and conceiving this so this is not an, a form of economic reductionism whatsoever because it's just a question of how are they actually reproducing themselves not what necessarily causes the question of causation is latent with the baggage of anglo-saxon uh metaphysics from the 17th century, which is about cause and effect, some kind of deeper primordial uh, cause or kind of Spinozan substance from which all reality is just the result of the kind of first cause. That's not, it has nothing to do with the dialectical uh, materialism of Marx and Engels or Lenin, Stalin and Mao for that matter. And if we understand their fundamental ontology, their fundamental philosophical basis of Marxism, it becomes very clear that from Marx to Engels to Lenin to Stalin to Mao to Deng and to Xi, there is a very clear and consistent continuity. It's just not a continuity that can be defined on the basis of a fixed doctrinal form. But the whole point of Marxism... Well, I, mean, Mao is, I mean, Mao is separate themselves from fascists by rejecting a command economy and commitment to class struggle. I mean, I don't see how... Deng didn't completely overturn this. You know, China has embraced yeah. class collaboration. It's embraced nationalism, uh, authoritarianism. Uh, you know, they're they're re they're integrating like a racial conception of nationalism into their conception of the state. I mean, it's like I mean, it's like ship of thesis. It's like, at which point does it stop being communist, or do we just have well, to accept I, yeah. that because well, Deng is a successor to Mao, that yeah. you know whatever he determines is in the Marxist lineage? Well, then it just means like, nothing. Like well, Mussolini it's, it's, can trace himself back to Marx as well. I yeah. mean, you could trace uh, Italian yeah, I mean, syndicalism from Marxism. And former Marxists. Okay, Why yeah, don't yeah, they I, have the I, can, I can address uh, what you say because it's a fair question, right? Why is it that we do not see a clear and overt form of class struggle uh, with not only in the Deng era, but even in the Mao era, right? Because remember, Mao understood there's a patriotic bourgeoisie, there's a patriotic petit, petit bourgeoisie that the Communist Party is trying to align itself with. So, and then you can even go back to Stalin and the, the era of the Popular Front and then the people's democracies after World War II. So the reason for that is, is because we cannot make assumptions about the form that class struggle is going to take. Now, the point of Mao's Why, why should I believe that this is still class struggle? I mean, they've embraced well, class it, collaboration. No, 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 because I'll explain. Because class struggle is not just, doesn't only take the form of political conflict between different political parties. Class struggle can also take the form of the imminent development of a society in such a way that comes at the expense of certain classes and benefits other classes. Yeah, that's um, what fascism did with economic corporatism. But uh, I don't see how that was in, in the history of fascism. What do you mean? There was a gradual, I mean, China went from yeah. uh, communism and gradually in introduced, you know, market reforms. It became more market oriented, more billionaires, more private well, ownership. Italy started from a more laissez-faire position and they gradually transitioned. They had a few years of laissez-faire to kind of build up the economy. It was hugely successful. Uh, they had one of the fastest growth rates in right. Europe. In the 30s, they switched to a more corporatist. The IRI and the, the bail. Yeah, market. sure. I mean, you yeah. know, by the mid-30s, I, I like 47% of he, he, like he, Italian he, capital in right. the stock exchange so, owned by the government. And by the time you get to 43 with the Italian Social Republic, it's more socialist than China is today. It was, it's like 74% well, I'll, I'll, everything uh, with more than yeah, yeah, yeah. employees. I, I can address all three, three of the points you just raised. So the first one... Um, is regarding to the question of um, the way in which it's the same in Italy. 
But listen, the key to understanding China and then modern China lies in land reform. Without understanding land reform, there's no meaning to Chinese communism. And by land reform, I mean the fact that despite all of the proletarianization that accompanied Chinese modernization, all the Chinese people still have some kind of social security safety net in the form of these small plots of intensive agricultural plots that they are given and granted by the state to um, have exclusive um, cultivation of. And then now with the Xi era, because they want to modernize agriculture more, they're starting to replace that with giving everyone homes, free, basically, uh, housing. Yeah, uh, I can respond uh, to this. Single unit apartments. So th- th- I just want to just this is just kind of the first point. Yeah, now, I respond to this. And again, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me, let me, let's just, I'll do the two more well, points. Yeah, I mean, you've done like respond. most of the talking on this out of everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, well, it's important, this... it's important to discuss uh, what you said about Italy because it's, it's interesting because in the interwar years, um, the, the form of land ownership from 1900 to 1919 was gradually being taken away from absentee landlords who owned, you know, 80% of the land in Sicily, 65% of the land in Calabria and um, elsewhere within Italy. I mean, like we have an overwhelming uh, monopoly of large landowners who owned all the land. With the rise of the fascist government, the popular uprisings, which um, were taking this land from the absentee landlords who were using the land for speculative purposes uh, to give uh, to fund uh, banks that gave loans to industrialists, the fascists crushed these uprisings and returned all the land uh, to the landlords. And the fundamental uh, ownership of the land in Italy did not change in the 1930s. Now, regarding the IRI and the so-called nationalizations, these were akin to bailouts of already bankrupted companies and failed capitalist enterprises, which in a free market economy would have just dissolved and been replaced. The government kept these, they propped them up. The same people who owned them were still in effect running them. It's just the government was claiming it was controlling and uh, owning them. In reality, they were transferring these industrial um companies under the control of finance uh, capital. And it's for these reasons that all- So the government purchasing 74% of the economy is being ruled by finance capital? What a load of of bullshit, man. All right, Haz, hold on, hold on. One at a time, one at a time, wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. Finish up what you're saying, Haz, and then let Keith get in, because I know he's chomping at the bit. So just go ahead and finish up there real quick. Yeah, yeah, just to Joel really quick. The devil's in the details. You have to understand what is meant by this ownership. It's more an oversight over, you know, allowing these former capitalists and industrialists to retain their position, which they were not going to because they went bankrupt. So the government bailed them out and called this a form of a nationalization. The final thing about the Italian Social Republic, really, really quick, two seconds. Um, Yeah, this was Mussolini's attempt to pander to a population that was already overwhelmingly disposed to socialism and communism, and they saw right through it. So it was a last-ditch effort by Mussolini to win over the trust of the Italian masses, which he failed to do. All right, now go ahead, Keith. Okay, well, firstly, on the land reform, yes, when the fascist governments took over, there was a massive land reform. But again, I feel like you're just ignoring, like, geopolitical realities. You know, the fascists had this conception that there are proletarian nations like Italy and Germany that are kept underdeveloped by Anglo-American mercantile powers and that it was necessary to develop productive forces. You know, this is the same kind of thinking as Sun Yat-sen. It's the same kind of thinking as the CCP now. And they put growth and industrialization ahead of these reforms. You know, most- Mussolini did embrace a kind of qualified laissez-faire when he first came to power, specifically uh, to develop productive forces, and it was successful. But it's not true that there was no land reform. And again, you know, the, they were constrained in such a way that they had to do this gradually. In terms of the nationalization in the 1930s, it's not true that the governance structure didn't change. These companies that were nationalized, they introduced a corporatist governance structure, labor and capital got equal representation on boards that ran these companies. And when you get into the 40s, there actually is massive land reform. They instituted a bill which is similar to the one you were talking about in China, where uh, uncultivated land and absentee landlords, this land was seized and it was actually dispersed among cooperatives and, and local farmers. So, I mean, this idea, and then this idea that, well, it was just to, like, uh, placate people at that point. Well, you can say that, but Mussolini considered the Italian Social Republic the true essence of fascism, and he lamented that during his time in power, he'd been held back by conservatives. He had a king that constrained him. I mean, the first fascist government was a coalition government. There was liberals in there. uh, There was leftists. So if you're going to say that, well, the early period where they embraced laissez-faire 
uh, temporarily to develop productive forces and they were in coalition with liberals and he was constrained by the king. That's the true fascism. But then when he had like complete total rule in the 40s and he starts nationalizing, he starts doing land reform, he introduces uh, radical social welfare bills that control 74% of the economy. Well, that's fake fascism because he's just trying to placate people. Why would I buy that? Because the, the latter stage is actually what's representative of early fascist thought. And, you know, all of the early fascists, that's the kind of way that they conceive fascism. I mean, Mussolini appointed Nicola Bombacci, the former head of the Italian Communist Party, as his economics minister in the Italian Social Republic. Uh, yeah. You know, are you going to say that these people were just, like, duped? Uh, You've got to take into consideration the geopolitical conditions of China as well. Like, China was an agrarian society. And so, obviously, land reform is going to be the first thing that they do, whereas if you're talking about, like, a, a far more industrialized uh, uh, kind of nation, like, you know, Germany or something under, like, Hitler, it's a completely different set of priorities. That, yeah, it would, uh, have, been su it would have been suicidal to just do this radical... You look in um, yeah, you look I, at the USSR. I, was I, I can Russia. protest... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna, the I, don't, I, don't wanna, I don't want to talk too much, so I just want to briefly address the two points because I've been talking a lot, but just really quick. Um... Land reform is the only basis proven by history to have an independent path to industrialization without seizing overseas colonies and in, in waging wars of aggression against your neighbors to seize their resources. Land reform specifically um, is the key to um, industrialization because it allows the surpluses of agricultural production to be directed for the specific purpose of industrialization. Because countries like Italy and Germany were never able to do this, they had to mobilize their entire economy and countries for the purposes of war rather than internal industrial development. So that's the point about land reform. Now, secondly, there wasn't actually any major land reform that um, distributed the land away from the landowners in the 30s and the 20s. Now, regarding the land reform during the I Italian the Social Republic, admittedly, my knowledge uh, of the land reform specifically that happened then is a little bit limited. But what I do know about the Italian Social Republic is that the words and the decrees by the government that were happening in fiat, the actual ruling classes and the actual like way in which the society was being governed in actual reality were two completely different realities. That's not true. They, they nationalized yeah. 80 of the biggest companies in Italy. They had 150,000 employees on combined. Paper. On paper. Well, that's sort of like when we did too big not to fail reality. bailouts. And it's like the idea that like we nationalize Lehman Brothers or something. Like, no, it's not that you can say that like that at all. Lehman Brothers don't that... do anything productive. <laughs> you can say well, that. That's, 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 that's our company. industry. No, like if we nationalize like G General Motors, Ford, like all these like actual things, Listen, that, uh, companies that produce. Italy, Motors, Italy, Italy never we? nationalized anything in any meaningful sense. They just allowed these they nationalized the Bank of Italy. They, they looted the Italian people to allow these bankrupt companies to have a lifeline when they otherwise in the free market. No, hold on. Okay, so nineteen. Thirty-eight in Italy, the state controlled seventy-seven percent of iron production. Okay, sixty-seven. What, what do you mean by control? It was controlled by the IRA. Well, what it's does that? What do you mean? What does that control mean? I think that was in the details. Remember, the control is not a direct form of control like in the Soviet Union. Where okay, so who's controlling yeah. it? You know, when all of this is, is the, the, the IRI is an institution a, a that was, the by the way, the IRI was an institution that was maintained for the purposes of steel production within Italy long after um, fascist. I don't know about long, it's relative, but it was continued through the 50s and the 60s. It actually remained as an institution yeah, up to the year 2000. And it was mainly a kind of financial organ that didn't actually directly control anything. Um, it just direct, it just, um, was an organ that was directed for the purposes of fulfilling a certain uh, industrial policy and industrial aim. Okay, and who, who was it acting on behalf of, if not the state? It was. The IRI was acting on behalf of the state. Okay, well, how is that any different from China? China has, like, private banks, but they own most of the shares. That's the same thing as the IRI. The, uh, Italy had the state body that controlled most of the shares of these companies and nationalized some of them. But the, the difference? difference is that all of the Chinese companies that exist now have been emerged and developed from the ground up, from the soil of the Chinese Yeah, well, people. they had different... That's because China was starting uh, with, with fuck all to begin with. They're different places. Yeah. They're like, well, they're the, in the, 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 obvious they're in the middle point of Europe. They're up against the, these mercantile the, powers. Listen, trying when to we develop Marxists, a yeah, 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 but we Marxists... they're going from American economy to socialism. But listen, you have to understand socialism to when more market economy. The, the difference, though, is that if these companies are coming and emerging from the soil of the Chinese people, that means the state it was overseeing not only what these companies are doing, 
but where they uh, their actual development it was actually responsible for where they came from and their emergence in the first place so it's not the same thing and the second thing that's important to understand here um is the fact that the reason Marxists say that fascism was the emergency organ of industrial and finance capitalists wasn't because we believe that they directly controlled fascists or even you know, funded the majority of uh, the of fascist them, yeah. resources, but precisely because these social formations and these economic structures, which would have otherwise not existed and would have been wiped out as a result of the crisis in 29, they were allowed to retain a lifeline because of fascism, whereas in, in China, for example... Well, why should I believe that there was, there was Germany and well, Italy were supposedly on the precipice of a communist revolution? Why didn't it happen in England or... I, I don't, I don't think they were on the precipice of a communist revolution. I don't believe they were. Okay, so what was going to happen in 1929 that didn't happen in Britain or France or Spain? Brit, Brit, I'll tell you, Britain, France and Spain all and Amer the United States all embarked on quasi-corporatist and... Um, socialistic policies to uh, save their economies as well um so i don't know what you're really asking I, so, if, if, any, if, so if anything, fascism so if fascism goes socialist it's uh you know it's it's in the aid of capitalism because there surely would have been like a greater proper socialist revolution no, it's not that there would have been a socialist revolution, but there would have probably been an economic uh, restructuring of the economy in some kind of way. Like new companies would have emerged at the expense of old ones, and new order would have emerged at the expense. Well, of like, the who cares if it's a new order. company or it's just an old one? If the state is taking it over and introducing a corporatist governance structure and giving labor equal representation and directing the direction of the company, I mean, it's like okay, fine. So these capitalists in China they developed while the CCP was in charge and you know if jack ma steps out of line they'll throw him in jail well what's the difference i mean yeah germany had already existing capital the, the difference is that if they stepped out of line Hitler yeah yeah it's it's precisely directed i'll explain it to you i'll explain it to you it's very simple actually the difference is precisely the fact that the fascist countries are too corporatist in, in a kind of um political sense of the word they did not have the sufficient degree of control over these companies to be able to completely wholesale reform and open up economies, eliminate industries, completely reform and change everything about their economy from the bottom up. The Chinese state now does have the power to do that because it gets... Yeah, its, and after uh, all the reform, they totally end up different context. But, but listen, but, How long has the CCP been, been in? The CCP's been in for 70 listen, years. During, they started with an agrarian the GCP, society. Right, yeah. Right now in the Xi era, there's a fundamental restructuring. And I'm saying the reason why the Chinese state is able to do this is because it gets its mandate directly from the small-scale uh, land holding or apartment holding, whatever, the Chinese people. That is where it gets its mandate. That is its sole authority. The, the Xi era is being characterized by this complete transformation of the various industries and sectoral uh, in, uh, interests and so on of the Chinese economy that is coming at the expense of there's no corporatism here between class collaboration. Classes are being eliminated wholesale because of the government's five-year plans and policies, and they can't do anything about it. The government doesn't have to compromise with any classes. It doesn't have to negotiate with them. It will pursue an industrial policy, and it will pursue I mean, it. Neither did solely according to the interests of the Capitalists Chinese people. were completely left out of the decision-making policies. In that, that's not Germany. what that's I not just true. said, though. That's not relevant that's to not what I said. That's not true about, about, about Germany, etc. Like, a lot of that stuff, like, really, um, like, why did Ford, like, have to create a, like, sub-spin-off brand for uh, Nazi Germany? That was due to American policies. It was not that, like, Germans had no problem with Ford running plants with uh, American, like, out of America in Germany. America. Okay, so that, that proves that capitalists were directing the National Socialists. I'm so saying that they didn't have a problem with them. I'm saying that the change. Then. I'm saying that the change was not determined from within their society. It was determined but, but, within ours. Like, so let's see which 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 country has more Wall Street dollars in it: National Socialist Germany or fucking China. I think China uh, by like no, billions and billions and yeah, billions. Yeah, well, the, the reason for that seventy percent of the Chinese economy is privatized at this point. It's like in terms of like it actually has like capitalists. Exports are private. Um, what yeah, do you mean by private, though? That, that, that there's a, someone called a capitalist who invests in the company and gets a surplus value, like uh, in, in response for their investment. You know, I don't. I don't even. Are you fucking that, Marxist? Yeah, that, but that doesn't even really describe capitalist countries anymore. So it's it's really oh. not true. What do you mean it's not true? Are you telling me that aren't people called investors in China yeah. who invest in 
stock in China that make money off that stock? Um, that, you're talking, like, are you talking according about, to Marx? That's, yeah, that's, yeah, if, that's if the you're capitalist mode about, of production, if correct? If you're talking about uh, financial derivatives and speculation, it is heavily restricted. I'm talking about, I'm talking about buying stock. I'm, I'm, I'm buying stock. Buying trading stock. Uh, I think for individuals, it's actually restricted within China. You can't just speculate on the stock market. Yeah, it's like an institutional thing. You have to, like, yeah. basically, that's like your job. It's like that's your job in the state. Is yeah, like you the can't just do that freely. So yeah. I don't know. What is what is that? Yeah, but you, okay, so you can't do it freely. So, that, so they basically protect a certain class of capitalists and only let them do it. They're state no. servants. No, they're, they're... There's literally, like, oh, yeah, so, 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 okay, yeah, oh, man, like I, I, man, I'd love to be a billionaire state, state servant. servant. Yeah, no, yeah, that's but, good, <laughs> right? But that, but no, but it comes with a trade-off, right? It comes with a trade-off because your your billions, all of that money. If you're Jack Ma, you don't have. Yeah, you're not. You don't control that, that a capitalist has in America. So let me let me explain it. Let me explain the billion. Let's say you're a billionaire within China, right? Billionaire is not employed to Germany. Let's say you're a billionaire within China, right? Billionaire is going to be your net worth. It's going to be your total holdings. In China, you are not free to just liquidate that wealth and do what you want with it. It's your wealth is being controlled. Sure, you got a state. fucking nice car, nice house, sexy wife. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, living well. Okay. Listen, listen, I, listen I what's wrong with civil servants in, doing Marx? Like, I'm, I'm not the fucking communist in this conversation. I got listen, no problem with Joel, it. Joel, <laughs> I'm a communist. I'm saying hold on. Italy, Italy had a reform that foreigners couldn't L buy let's, stocks in Italian companies. That, that's fine, but let's go back to Marx here. Mar and Marx's critique of the Gotha program, what you're describing is inequality. Some people have nice cars and nice houses, and some people don't. I don't that's, get how... No, what I'm describing, what I'm describing is the capitalist Germany. mode of production. That's what I'm describing. No, no, you're describing the cultural phenomena of inequality, but Marx himself is, is there surplus value or not? But Marx, let's, well, we can talk about surplus value later, but Marx himself described within the critique of the Gotha program that in a socialist society, inequality will still prevail. And Lenin described the same thing because uh, you're, you will be compensated on the basis of your work, right? Uh, according to your work. But people have different degrees of being able to do different kinds of work because of contingencies. So that's how Chinese Marxists will explain it. Some people, for contingent reasons, uh, it's almost like an American capitalist talking point you hear. Uh, like they work harder, they worked harder, and they got more money, right? It's different from just being a capitalist per se, because a capitalist presupposes the institution of private property first and then the profits later. It's not based on your labor. So yeah, I, I understand that it's technocratically it's, it's, it's very administered. Difficult. Yeah, I would argue that it's collectively. All of, all I would have mind supply, if all of this applies to National Socialist Germany. I mean, they brought in a wage leveling law that restructured wages so that it was based on the effort of the worker rather than anything else. That, 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 that's, changed that's, ninety-seven percent of wages. That's for wages, though. That's not for the industrial capitalist and financial capitalist class that was still. It is. Yeah, the Germany's economy. Way. Yeah, they had lowered their wages. They were they literally crazy. nationalized the whole like like so much of the but, banking but listen, system. They're not like, getting uh, wages. They're, they're not getting wrong wages. That. They're not a wage earning class primarily. They're a class that earns their money through profit. These Chinese billionaires are not a wage earning class either. I, I didn't say they were. Yeah, well, exactly. Okay, well, so what's the fucking difference? Well, it, the point he brought up wasn't specifically relevant because the underlying point I'm trying to say here. Um, is that there's no corporatism. There's no negotiating with any segment of... The CCP does not share power with any class or segment of Chinese society. It is solely accountable to the Chinese people. Now, what is yeah, their... So, so Wait, let me ask a question. It's not workers' vanguard. I mean, that's fascism. I I'm going to ask no, a question it's, of... It's, the reason why it's a proletarian <laughs> dictatorship is because the proletariat is only meaningful within this wider context of the people as a whole. The proletariat... The reason why it's a proletarian dictatorship is because the proletariat is the class that emerged, that was uprooted from its uh, means of subsistence and its means of production. And the proletarian dictatorship is specifically attuned to allowing the Chinese people to endure revolutions in the fourth of production, which will inevitably uproot them from their original means of production. The small holding right. agriculture is being uprooted, and Xi is responding to that. Instead of throwing these people on the street and leaving them with nothing, like in a capitalist society, they're getting free... Uh, All right, let me ask you a question. Units. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to let you talk some more. I'm asking you a question, so you'll still get to talk. Uh, now, you mentioned earlier that there is a continuity uh, between going all the way back to Marx, uh, to Xi, uh, the guy you just mentioned. Uh, what What is that continuity? Uh, if you want to get super sure, specific, yeah. you can, I but I think that's pretty important. I don't want to ramble, but right. I would describe it yeah. to simplify it concretely. It's the dialectic between form and content. So for Marx, this originally takes the form 
of the kind of the whole uh, structure, apparatus, or whatever you want to call it, the project of German idealism culminating in Hegel's uh, system. For Marx, uh, the real content of this system, the real truth of the insight of Hegel lies in the material reality of the proletariat. So this is the first way in which Marx uh, initiates his kind of discovery. Real human, and then in the case of Feuerbach, Feuerbach has an imagined humanity, right? Uh, he's a humanist, but his human is idealized. Marx says, no, this is, uh, humanity is no idle abstraction of the imagination. Humanity is a real and determinate humanity, specifically as it takes the form of uh, the proletariat. Then uh, Lenin comes, and Lenin uh, is dealing with the institution of uh, European social democracy, and he's trying to bring this into uh, Russia. So, and Lenin discovers that the real essence of this institution of the party form cannot actually be found in the ready-made forms legislated by the party itself, but must be. Uh, you must delve deeper and deeper into the ground, into the soil of the Russian peasantry, right? So it's this and then you can keep going with Stalin. Uh, it's Stalin doesn't actually call himself a, an innovator of Marxism. He just says he's the most faithful servant of Lenin. And Stalin's collectivization and his wager upon the Russian middle peasants is an extension of Lenin's fundamental discovery. And then Mao uh, continues this by almost eliminating the significance of the industrial proletariat altogether and recognizing that the fundamental class differentiations are to be found in the Chinese people, specifically the Chinese peasant more generally. So then Mao is this more kind of populist uh, contribution. Then with Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping is the final nail in the coffin um, to the Soviet Leg the legacy of the Soviet-inspired system of central planning, which actually Mao was always in tension with and contradicting from the very beginning. Um, so there's kind of an echo. So with Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening, uh, reform and opening up, the real innovation and insight of Maoism, which um, is uh, striving away from this kind of top-down, centralized or overly centralized kind of um, institutionalized bureaucratic Soviet system where everything is just planned, to a system that actually develops socialism from the soil of the Chinese people. Uh, themselves. And now with the Xi era, after the development of the forces of production, we are now opening into a new era of an authentic communist morality. So the question remains, now that we have developed the forces of production, what is the aesthetic, cultural, uh, so on and so on? What values will define the orientation of the development of the forces of production? And this kind of spiritual uh, orientation is what defines uh, the G era. That, so, that's uh, just so like ironic uh, yeah. to me because uh, you know, you, like, as you guys are like, you love Hegel and you love Marx, and uh, it's just the way you describe that. It's almost like uh, I'm listening to Gen Giovanni Gentile or some shit, you know, because uh, you know, with Hegel, you know, you got this move from the concrete subject to the to the abstract object. Uh, and then Marx flips out on his head with his materialism, right? You know, you have the concrete object, you move to the, 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 uh, the kind right of abstract the subject. Abstract to the concrete. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's, you know, the, but Hegel in the philosophy of right, I mean, I, I don't like Hegel's metaphysics that much, but I, the philosophy of right I find profound where you have this kind of distinction between this like classical distinction that goes all the way back to ancient Greek philosophy, like in uh, Western political thought, really, between the, this polarity between anarchy and tyranny. You know, you, you know, on the one hand, you have this notion of like, you know, the free conscience, um, the self-actualization of the individual. Uh, but if you just kind of, you know, you, you, uh, what's the dude's name? Max Stoner is like, you know, just going all all in on that. You just become this. Well, the other direction is uh, you have this notion of like, you know, the the collective good, the the legal and, and moral principles of the political. Uh, but if you completely negate like the individual's role, then you're you're a tyrant. Um, and, uh, you know, Hegel says, okay, we've got to find some kind of sublation of this dichotomy. We've got to, we've, we've got to kind of synthesize these things together. And so it becomes the kind of voluntary identification with, uh, you know, of the individual with the, the collective good. Now, Hegel is a libtard. So he, he no. has this like, he has this <laughs> kind of a uh, defense of enlightenment liberalism He's a little a Republican. bit. He's not, whatever, the time. point, the point is, um, this notion of like uh, this, this notion of uh, the identification, as would have been understood in Hegel's day, 
is within this bourgeois liberal context. Whereas when you get to the 20th century, obviously we live in mass society, uh, the effects of mass production. Um, the, 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 there's a completely different kind of conception of civil society at this point. We don't have uh, this kind of elite bourgeois civil discourse. Um, now we have like this mass produced kind of uh, inundation of um, uh, ideological kind of imposition by this this kind of mass media system. And this is the context out of which fascism, uh, you know, communism and, uh, you know, progressivism, they all kind of rise in this early 20th century uh, and so-called mass democracy. Um, and in this context, G Gentile comes along as a respecter of Marx and Hegel, and he says, okay, so in order to, like, achieve this synthesis between you know, the individual and the collective, there needs to be an identification with a kind of spiritual mission of the state. And you could see, you know, Mussolini talk about that the conception of the state ultimately is religious in fascism, that, that there is a, that there is a kind of, and, and this is not done in a way that just completely negates Marx either, but it's this kind of synthesis of the idea that the, the, like the subject is not just an individual unto himself as the, in, the, in the kind of classical enlightenment conception, but instead the subject kind of actively constructs himself in his self-actualization within, uh, with, within like his relation to the spiritual idea of the state. Now, this is why I respect, I, I can kind of respect the Chinese uh, you know, in, a, in a profound way because you can see that there's this kind of authenticity that they're trying to strive towards of um, that – which is why I also respect the cessation of this kind of class struggle nonsense and this striving toward this uh, concept of, uh, you know, the national idea as ultimately the kind of uh, basis for its legitimacy. But like, to me, this, this, there's so much, I don't understand how you guys can just sit there and not see like there's a massive amount of convergence between what, what was, was going it? on in, in Italy uh, with uh, these fascist intellectuals in the early 20th century and the development in, in Chinese thought the last few decades? Yeah, you could I say, can, oh, there's little subtle there's differences. Way things could have gone. Things could have gone differently. But the, but the thing is, right, is like in actual material history, like who did the fascists like decide that their ally was? Did they decide to ally with the Soviet Union and the forces of communism? Because if they had, they probably would have been able well, to. Well, I, I think be, I can actually. The Anglo Atlantic world. This is where geopolitics comes in, though, because. Germany. Yeah, it's not about ideology like, here. Germany was not in the same position that China was in. Like it, it, we all talk about land reform and they how like when uh, Mao first comes to power, the Soviets send over. This is what we did with Stalin. You guys should try this. You know, command economy. They try it for a bit and go, this this is fucked. We're not doing this. Yeah, I can because, because the Chinese didn't have to do it because they weren't in the same geopolitical stress that the Russians were in, and also the Germans. The Germans knew if we don't. The kind of Lebensraum kind of concept uh, in national socialist ideology. That's a geopolitical concept uh, that predates national socialist ideology by decades. And it's, and basically yeah, the idea, the Germans knew if we don't expand this state militarily into the East, you know, uh, and, and gain new territory, we're going to get cucked by America. We're going to get, uh, we're going to get cucked. Because they couldn't do land reform. They didn't do land reform. Because they didn't do land reform. They, 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 didn't, they didn't have land. land. Like they, 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 they did. They did. not in the same capacity as, they, did. Uh, they didn't want to do land They didn't have time. They didn't have time. They had to, they had to go from zero to 100 like that. Not, they, had to build, they had to build a war machine like that. They didn't have time. The Soviet, Soviet Union, Union, yeah, the Soviet Union, as I said, brutalized their people as well to, to create. They, I mean, like the the. Uh, it's not just the, about land reform. Well, this, I mean, this, 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 the Kulaks are resources. The Kulaks already if, if, if already Germany, already liberated. If Germany cooperated with the Soviet Union peacefully, then both of their developmental needs could have been reached without those tragedies. Germany's technical expertise could have helped develop the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union's resources could have fulfilled the needs of uh, Ger the German industrialization. So they didn't. But I just wanted to go back. The Japanese didn't declare war in bomb Pearl Harbor, but like uh, invaded Russia from the other but side. Maybe I think, gonna uh, be different too. Here's, here's an important distinction, though, that we have to draw, I think, between because you mentioned Gentile and stuff. I just want to talk briefly about that. I think the most important distinction here is that for Marx, the issue is not so much the contradiction between the individual and the collective. The issue is really this is the crux of the contradiction between the state and the civil society. Marx's entire point is that Hegel's civil society is an imagined civil society that does not fundamentally, and like Hegel's idea is basically like, here you have the state and it must reconcile itself and be harmonious 
with its origins and its real foundations in the civil society. As Marx pointed out, though, the two actually do enter into contradiction with each other in such a way that the state becomes annihilated in civil society. And this was actually the fate of Prussian uh, constitutional monarchy it's, or monarchy itself, is that it was annihilated because of what was going on in the imminent development of civil society. The, the distinction with fascism, though, that's relevant here is that despite what you might think and what we're taught by Cold War propaganda, communist states are not total states. And what I mean by that is that these are states that are cognizant of their own imminent limitation, their own inability to permanently conquer their origins and their material basis in civil society. That's why I say the only contract that the the CCP is going to negotiate with is the Chinese people, because in contrast to the kind of Mussolini idea that the state and the people are one and they're actually the same thing, China recognizes, and the Soviet Union also recognized in its own way, that the state and the people are not actually always already the same thing. There is a contradiction between them, and the state must acknowledge its own um, limitation in this regard. This is why, for example, with Stalin's collectivization, uh, the the, the coal causes are not state-owned property. They are actually collective farms owned and property of the collective uh, farm. Uh, There, Stalin must acknowledge, and Stalin writes this in his Economic Problems of the USSR, which is, this is why we have a socialist commodity, this is why we need prices, this is why commodities persist, because we cannot just go to the peasants and just uh, loot and steal all of their land and their resources. It belongs to them. We, the state, cannot make it state property because this would amount to a form of robbery. Of the I just want to say something. It, this about is pure ideology. Before we move off, this, to... this is pure ideology because the the uh, reality in Russia was the. I mean, obviously, like for many uh, for many centuries, the uh, peasantry of Russia was under the boot of uh, you know the gentry. No, um, but but no, otherwise no, it was, it let's, was let's, collectively owned for most of the Russian the Russian peasantry owned the land collectively. Even yeah, they the, they were liberated by um, you know the Tsar already, like in many cases. Uh, for, in many cases, like at least partially. But then once you get the degeneration of um, the Russian political system, you know, in World War One, where everything so goes to shit, uh, you know, prior to the Bolshevik se- seizing power. The the peasants basically were were basically liberated at this point. They completely. Uh, You're talking like the, about Stolypian reforms. Uh, the Stolypian reforms, which yeah, 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 but like, but not even talking about reforms at this point. Like by the time that when the Bolsheviks first seized power, they don't even have control of the rural areas. Like they, they you know, it was a proletarian revolution, right? So they had control of the uh, urban areas. Um, they had very limited control of of, of the uh, of the rural areas, and basically the rural areas were like law unto themselves. They were the, the, in many no, cases the, they, the they, they didn't they didn't need to, they didn't yeah, really yeah. have any good enough incentive the, the to Bolshevik participate in the Soviet uh, in yeah, the early. The, the Bolshevik what? revolution was possible because the Bolsheviks promised land reform and the soldiers. No, no, no. Yeah. This is bullshit. This is no, absolute no. bullshit. It but was a, it was a proletarian revolution. The peasants uh, reluctantly went along with it because they were like, oh fuck, uh, the, the uh, we don't we don't really want the, the we don't want the aristocracy succeeded. coming back. No, the, the only reason the Bolsheviks succeeded is because they didn't promise and initiate a program of land reform, which the soldiers and sailors and those people who did come from peasant families and backgrounds were very responsive to and and uh, recipient to, and as a result. Of the Bolshevik Revolution, large noble and propri- proprietary estates were divided and given to the peasants. I'm pretty sure the peasants were Ooh. kind of happy being left alone, not Stalin but, showing but this, up with a this, bunch of dudes this, from this, the cities things, right? to point guns in people's faces well, one, and force one, them to do shit on their own land. Most of them, most of them had the land in common in some kind of way already when it was redistributed. But the second thing is, as a result of the Stolypian reforms, there was a form of individual, uh, specific individual land ownership. And this gave rise to the Kulak, but it was an artificial invention of the Stolypian reforms that was not an organic feature or character of the Russian peasantry or the Russian people. And that's the that's why the Kulaks posed such an issue for... Oh, yeah, so sending a bunch of, like, dudes in from the city with uh, fancy uniforms to, like... Uh, like uh start running these farms like yeah. bureaucratically it might like have be like this like managerial class come in and like oppress them and like take all their shit it, uh, it, was, it like, was an extremely ha- violent thing that happened it was extremely oppressive extremely violent I'm not yeah, but it's totally it's totally but, but like, all, the, all I would it's antithetical upon, joel but all i'm going to insist upon is a crucial difference that this is the foundation of all modern 
industrial and uh, modernity in general to begin with. And this violence will either happen in your own country. I mean, hopefully now we're at a state, we don't need this anymore because the, co- the differences in the cap- concentration of capital, we have China now, which can help develop countries so they don't have to go through this. But this is the this is the, this, the hidden origin of modernity itself. If it's not going to be your own country, it's going to be someone else. Yeah, someone I, I said at the East. beginning, I didn't criticize Stalin. I said yeah. Stalin was presented with so like, a, pretty example, much an impossible choice. He had all to, right, like, now uh, let me put a pin in this. Let me let Keith get in there because I'll let you guys go long. Long, and I know he wanted to yeah. talk like oh, I just want to say good. something like because yeah. Logo dropped in this thing oh well the you know the fascists they chose to like ally with the capitalist powers and they went after the Soviet Union I mean I think everything Logo's dropped in so far is just like straight up wrong like it's just like basic bitch like communist myths well what's, the thing what's about wrong about the, that what's wrong about that well it's what's not what's true what's wrong about like the, the fact that the fascists presented themselves specifically as anti-communist like yeah I'm going to I'm going to explain well, okay, so Hitler throughout the 20s and 30s, he, and, you know, most fascists don't get this either, but he always presented Anglo-American Jewish capitalism as the primary threat. And the first time, the first mention from Hitler of anti-Semitism is the, the Geimlich letter, and there's no mention of communism in it. He's talking about the Jews directing international capitalism and them identifying more than Jews than their nation state. And when he starts to mention communism, he talks about it as a phenomenon that's directed from Wall Street. And he never mentions communism as a primary threat, except in kind of public speeches and propaganda. Uh, But he sees it as a way for international finance capital to weaken nations. Now, in terms of like the invasion of Russia, a lot of the national socialists uh, in the 1930s, before they got elected, uh, wanted to go ahead with this uh, position of moving forward with an alliance of Russia and focus on, the, focus on the West. Hitler's reason for rejecting this was purely like geopolitical. He, you know, you're talking about land reform, but I mean, there was a different conception of like development at that time. And Hitler's very much had this conception of kind of space and race. And, you know, his experience of sort of fighting german descended soldiers uh, in U.S. uniforms in World War I really influenced this. And Hitler believed that if a European power didn't emerge with the kind of scale of the United States, that no one would be able to take on the hegemony of the emerging North American power, as he called it. So Hitler struck east, but it was very much with this long-term thinking that Germany would either become a great power, the magnitude of the U.S., that could challenge uh, capitalist hegemony over the world, or to be destroyed. And he says this in speeches throughout the 20s and 30s. He, t- he contrasts, um, you know, he compared Germany. He said that the fate of Germany would be like India or Ireland, that would be one of these dispossessed colonial nations. And, uh, you know, his thinking was very much that, uh, you know, it was uh, expansion or destruction. I mean, there's a quote from See, the Brendan Sims. There's a lot of American capitalists who said the same thing, though. Okay, so Brendan Sims says the, the this is like a popular biography that came out in Hitler recently. It's a pretty respected historian. The crucial point is that Hitler did not primarily justify the quest for Lebensraum with the inherent inferiority of the Slav population there as an ideological war against Bolshevism or even as a first step towards the annihilation of Jews in Europe. His aim throughout was not world domination, but simple national survival. Hitler may have spoken privately of his hopes for world hegemony, but this was probably Buster. It's more likely that, at least at this stage, Hitler did not envisage world domination by Germany as opposed to the world power status necessary for survival. And you also have his second book, which he didn't actually publish because it gave away too much of his geopolitical thinking. But throughout the second book, when he's talking about expanding East, the primary threat throughout is the Anglo-American, the Anglo-Saxon capitalist powers, as they call them. And again, the line of thinking is that either Germany is going to get enough space to the East to industrialize sufficiently to challenge the United States, uh, or it's going to perish. So, I mean, just like reading ideology into this, I mean, fascists do this as well, like, oh, is this great crusade against communism? Like... I mean, it's just like juvenile stuff. Well, yeah, there, what, but, but, but okay, so what if, but like, do you think, like, what, okay, so you're saying fundamentally, like, so they weren't primarily anti capitalist, they were pri- uh, primarily anti communist, but they just considered communism to be essentially like another hand of the capitalists, right? Mm hmm. No, they were just okay, saying so, propaganda to justify their geopolitical interests, which was the, the, Hitler didn't give so a fuck about yeah, when the they led, When they led the, with the anti-communist it, stuff, I mean, that's the choice was okay. Like it's us or them. Like either, either we expand or we die. Here's the issue. The issue is that 
there's two things, right? Hitler was very clear that he wanted to divide the world with the British Empire. He admired the British Empire, and he was not uh, against the British Empire per se. Now, I guess he did talk about Anglo-American Jewish capitalists or whatever, but the fact is that Hitler expanded East uh, primarily because he was wa- wanted to make the signal to the Western powers that, hey, I'm just going to go take on the Soviet Union. If you leave me alone, it, it really doesn't concern you, right? And he thought that he would get away with invading Poland, doing all these things and breaking treaties with England and uh, these other countries because he thought that they would just not mind him uh, confronting the Soviet Union and going eastward. So, I mean, I don't know what his long-term, imagined long-term goal necessarily is, like, oh, he wants to compete with America or whatever, but concretely, like specifically as it's relevant to the situation there, Um, Hitler was making signals to the Anglo-American ruling classes, whether they're Jewish or otherwise, it doesn't really concern me, um, that he was going to be their champion against the Soviet Union. Well, yeah, he wanted to avoid a world war with Britain. But I mean, he still, he still saw he still saw capitalism as the primary threat, and he was trying to create a powerful enough state it, to take that on. I mean, it was not is... in Germany's interest to go to war with Britain because Britain had nothing to offer Germany. Like I know, I know, I don't think Germany wanted to go to war with Britain, but I yeah, think, um, yeah, I think that Germany wanted to get away with um, invading the East, and they thought they would just get away with this. But the yeah, problem... but it's not a, it's not a bad ideology. It's not about like oh, fascism is inherently this, and uh, it's it's yeah. about no, the it's whole geopolitical that. reality of. Uh, but, the situation but here's, that he was here's, here's in. Much like that, Stalin's behavior, much like uh, Mao's behavior, they were able to make different but, decisions but here, because the they had different uh, yeah, material but, historical circumstances. Here, here's you know? the thing is that I get it that it, it was in the interest of the German economy as within the specific political order uh, of the Nazis were ruling that, yes, they needed more resources and they needed more space to appease the German population, which was not being given a land reform internally. But the reason for that was because the Nazis... Um, you can either say that they were acting on behalf of or they had to compromise with the German uh, monopolists and landowners. The fact stands that this was why they had to, there was an internal kind of social tension within Germany that they had to mitigate by promising the German people that they're going to get their plot of land and their homestead uh, in the East. This is also why they failed because, because they were beholden to this class. This class didn't give a shit about the Nazis in the first place. They're not beholden to the class. I mean, no, 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 listen, Again, listen, listen. I'm making a point. Hitler, Hitler it, said no, I'm not, no, 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 listen, let me finish my fucking point, man. Let me, please, I haven't talked that much. I that haven't talked that much. That he wanted to create a classless me... society in the long run. So, I mean, the idea that okay. this is like I finish my the point? capitalist class. Can I finish my point? I'm talking about just cold geopolitical realities here, okay? So, You're really not. Hitler's... Yes, I am. I'm about to, if you let me, okay? So Hitler's, all all of these monopolists, the landowners, basically the ancient regime, like the fucking hereditary aristocracy of Germany at the time, they supported Hitler to a point point but as soon as it like as soon as there was going to be any attempt at land reform in that sense that is when they collaborated extremely hand in glove with british capitalists and the like german secret intelligence service was literally all double agents for uh the so british where was what you're saying is that hitler was based and he got betrayed by a bunch of like capitalists i'm saying he didn't th- no i'm saying because he didn't what? do the land reform early enough if he did that if he was doing land reform early enough then maybe he would have stood a chance at all look the way that he, like, miss, like, like, who, are, who are the who are the major capitalists supporting hitler prior to his election Henry Ford, uh, to name okay, so one. Like, what was, what was, the, fin- name? What was the financial support well, which for the election? Nazi party by there Henry Ford? Elections, so which election are you referring to? Okay, any time prior to him taking power, what was the major... After 32, support? he met with uh, industrialists, and they supported him in the next election. There was no election after... What do you mean, after 32? There, there was an election in 32, I believe, and then oh, after... Oh, the you mean in 32, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is from Henry Ashby Turner, who's a Yale historian who wrote like the most authoritative book on this. He says big business support was virtually uh, zero prior to the election of 1933. It reached a high point in the spring of 32, followed by a decline through the autumn that continued until Hitler's appointment as chancellor. Uh, but at the high point in 1932, the NSDAP seemed unstoppable. So at that point, like the capitalists are trying to get yeah. on the winning team. But there's... it's not about whether or not they financially supported them. But what I'm saying is that when he had to make up his, state, they didn't support right, them at all. There's like there's positions. literally two and there's two no, major. Who, 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 he, he, here's the thing. State. State. Here's the thing. So prior prior to 32, I don't think that the majority of the ruling class in Germany was behind the Nazis and behind. Well, they were massively opposed to them. 
Well, uh, that's new. that's uh, the one of the biggest capitalists in Germany supported the Stenz revolt, which was this SA revolt that was trying to take out Hitler. Yeah, they yeah, were... that, that's fine. But here's what's important: the Nazis would not have been able to seize and retain power if they did not act on behalf of the interests of the German ruling class. They did not come at the, into power. My theory of uh, Nazism. Why, why wasn't is... there support for them then? What's that? Why wasn't there support from them then, from the ruling class? Well, because initially they were kind of like a street gang, right? But then they came to a point where they were gonna, they wanted to get elected and seize power, so they made a deal with the industrials that, hey, we're going to be the kind of anarchist thugs that are going to keep things in line and keep things... Uh, no, no, they, they vastly supported the Republic still right Hitler's up to 1933. In, in fact, the, the Nazis actually took a more anti-capitalist line in 32. But hold on, in 32, in Hitler gave a speech to the group of German industrialists saying, hey, we're the best bet to save you guys and allow you guys to keep your um, position. He, he almost said this stuff ad verbatim in 32. Yeah, and in 1933, so Turner says, uh, it championed the prerogatives of uh, the parliament and the interests of workers as part of an offensive designed to discredit Papen's presidential, what they called cabinet of barons. The NSDAP swerved they had rhetoric. Yeah, they had prop. They were rhetoric in words. And okay, then, so but know, where's the material support for the Nazis? I mean, you're saying like they kind of, you know, they kind I, of. I don't think you're understanding my any, point. I don't think they had substant necessarily substantive material support among the German people to actually seize power. They seized first. There were a kind of a organization that was filled with many lumpen elements and declassed elements and uh, middle class type of elements, and they were kind of a ragtag group of thugs, basically, right? And then they were, um, when the time came, they were allowed to have power by the German capitalists. So they never actually had a substantive base in the German people at all. It's just, they were anarchists, more or less, who were allowed, they were unleashed on German society. What does that mean, that they they never had substantive support? I mean, they won the election without support from major industrialists, with most industrialists supporting the republic. At at what point did they win the election without the support of the industrialists? 1933. No, by 33, they already had the industrials behind them. No, they didn't. Yes, they okay, did. Who was, who was supporting them? We just, all of them. All the major German that's industrialists. Not, that's not true. That's not true. Yeah, there, was one, was, there was one industrialist that was openly pro-Nazi. Openly, for, uh, yeah, for but I'm not talking about openly. Okay, I'm so how can you... Natural, well, yeah. what are you going to do to prove it? Do you have any... Like, y- yes. Because Hitler, Henry I'm talking about, Turner wrote a yeah, book yeah, on this. Yeah, let me try to look it and up. And he couldn't find... Like, he couldn't find one person except for... Hitler's speech... Okay, so you're going to tell me a speech again. Where's the material support? Okay, um, so if, if Hillary Clinton is giving speeches to major industrialists, do you think that there's any material support there, or is that just a coincidence? Then there was also the secret meeting in 20th of February, 1933. Uh, hit, uh, Hitler and 20 to 25 industrialists. Um, the Yeah, he often all, reached out to try and get support from industrialists, but it never materialized in time. No, you know I mean? he there received was, the equivalent. Okay, so, so, what, so, once, so once he's like fully in and he's, and he's like, you know, he's, he, he received he's the equivalent of around 10 million, um, what is today in today's terms, 10, it was 2 million Reichsmarks at the time um, were contributed at the meeting. So they were, he was from giving who? support. From who? Um, let me see. Uh, let's go. This was all stuff from the like new Turner's movie. emphatic on this that like there is a lot of money from small donations and they were really good at collecting a lot of small. That was donations. before. That was before. No, it's the same right up to then. No, it was before Her- like, thirty. Turner says only true gross distortion can big business be afforded a crucial or even major role in the downfall of the republic. He's absolutely emphatic on this. Yeah, but he's he couldn't possibly be talking about what everyone. Yeah, I mean, you're not giving me anything. You're like, oh, they had a meeting here and there. I mean, yeah, the party like existed for one. So I, I, I can actually power. show of you. So gonna reach out. It had nothing to do with their millions so, of members. So it, was um, just, it was just like these like three capitalists that gave him a few. No, mil it's on the far side. more. I, I. G. Farben, four hundred thousand Reichsmarks. You have a guy named Der I. A. Stanky, two hundred thousand. You have Carl Hermann, one hundred fifty thousand automobile. Ostelug, Berlin, 100,000. Uh, Carl Hermann, Berlin, uh, Deutsch, I can't pronounce this shit, 150,000. Pretty much a lot of people are giving them money here. You know, it's, it's not just one or two people. I know where you're getting this from because Turner says that there's only two major industrialists that supported the Nazis prior to their election, Sitzen and von Borsig. And this and ended up in the which election is talking publicly, about? You're, which I prior to him getting into are, power, any of the elections, prior to him getting into power, the, it must be that his contention must have been before the election of 33. Of 33. You're probably talking about before the election of 30, uh, 32. 
No, he's talking about them before getting into power. Like I said, I can give you the quote again. Only true gross uh, distortion can big business be afforded a crucial or even major role in the downfall of the republic. So he's talking about before 32. No, the downfall of the republic when Hitler gets into power. Quote, well, okay, to the, cons- listen, to the listen. consolidation of Hitler's okay, regime listen, after he Turner, became chancellor. I can't, I can't he and his party had previously received relatively so how does, how does from Turner, that quarter. How does Turner address... Um, the um, Hitler speech to the industry club in the 1932. Like, how does he address these kind of things? Yeah, Turner. That Turner were yeah, of course. Like Hitler was trying to reach out to influential people. You know, he like he. One of You're his saying his friends he went, Yeah, one of his friends went to America to meet Henry Ford, but he'd never commit anything financially. You know, they were in touch with like the okay. uh, white Russian emigres, and yeah, they. Yeah, they tried to reach out to industrials. Or uh, von Borsig, who was one of the only support, one of the two industrials that supported him, tried to get bef- uh, before they got power. He tried to raise support in Berlin, and uh, you know he was an anomaly. He gave up after a few months, and he doesn't seem to have supported them materially at all prior to getting into power. But even if he got some cash on the side, he uh, telling me in like you know like 1937 that if, 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 if uh, one of these industrialists plan. piss Hitler off, that he couldn't do something about it, like. Uh, you know, like the dude consolidated his power. Sometimes you got to play. You got to play a little chess. You know what I mean? Well, like, I'm I don't really see a huge problem with it. Right yeah, but they, they went leftward uh, before getting into power. Um, I'm looking at a source right now. Hold okay. on. Okay. Yeah, to to like sort of, I don't feel like my point was addressed. So I'll kind of expand on. Okay, it. hold on. I, I can. Uh, okay, right. the same they official okay, estimate yeah, okay. to the total. Sorry, sorry, Logan. I don't mean to cut you off, man. This is, I've just been looking through this for Just go right after me, right? Total contributions for one of the Reichstag election campaigns of 32 and approximately 200,000 to 300,000 marks. Of this, he reported no more than... Um, okay, so 10 to 15% had, had gone to the Nazis, and this was in 32. Uh, 10 to 15% Farben, of what? Well, I gave you a quote that he, he the reached in 32, election. and then it when declined it, when after, on, and they went leftward. When did they go leftward? Uh... In like the spring of '32, right up to getting elected. Yeah, but th- this was in rhetoric. This wasn't actually what was going on behind the scenes. What do you mean? What was happening behind the scenes? They got less support from big business before the 1933 election. I'll give you another, another quote from Turner. Quite yeah. contrary to the widespread impression that Hitler gained power in January '33 with strong backing from big business, his appointment to the chancellorship came just when relations between his movement and the business community had reached the lowest point since the NSDAP's election gains of 1930 had forced it yeah. upon the attention of the politically engaged men of big business. Well, it's the lowest point, but relative to what? Because it's so, like... basically, he played the game. He got in position, and then once he was had a run of power, he just started giving the middle finger. Okay. Well, local one. Yeah, 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 local. Didn't yeah. even get the material so, support. I'm, I'm going to read like, more. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Find the source. Right. Good luck. Go ahead. So my point, my point was that he, um, unlike the communists, right? The communists tended to uh, depose the former order and replace it entirely with their own new order, right? So like this is this is why there was like tons of like purges and things because you had a ton of like fucking intelligence agents and industrials and industrial assets and fucking capitalists all over the place from all over the world really in that country who were uh, trying to you know get what they could out of the this new developing country um in germany uh in hitler didn't, didn't do that he didn't get rid of these people he didn't replace he got them. Hitler, hitler is, nationalized his business in 1930 the problem with yeah, hitler is he didn't kill enough people you know he's, he's, no he, not he, enough he was, of the capital okay, I, 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 have a quote, I have a quote right here anyone that opposed the national the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a, a, I'm reading a source it's kind of true like uh, stalin this was kind of way more badass in a way was way more badass this is page 68 of the same the book henry turner big business and the rise of hitler he says, but more important, once he was in office, Hitler demonstrated that he was always reassured them, not a socialist. He therefore had no difficulty in extracting large sums from big business, starting with the campaign for the Reichstag election of March 1933. These contributions unquestionably aided Hitler significantly. Um, but they uh, aided him in the consolidation of his power. And, and this well, is Turner. I have a quote from story. Turner where he says big business support was virtually zero prior to the election. Personally, because, I couldn't because, give a fuck. It's like if, said, if I was in Germany in 1933 and Hitler just became like Fuhrer your, your or whatever, I would have been like fucking on, sweet. No, I'm from my own source where he says that was virtually zero support prior to the election of 1933. But he says big business contributed significantly to the consolidation of Hitler's power in 1933. 
Well, if he says that, that contradicts the entire rest of the book. Well, he, he says, he he says, says big business was not the election. I'll, I'll quote why, can't you, why can't you name some? He like said he aided the two, him in the consolidation of his power, Dixon. not its acquisition. So he's not saying that... Okay, the, so when he yeah. comes to power, then they get on board. Yeah, of course. They didn't put yeah. him in power, though. But to consolidate his power is the point. Yeah, so he gets into power and they're like, okay, we better support But you have to him. understand that Turner, which is... You gotta pay the man. He's, Tur he's fucking Turner running the show. one of the historians, and, and there's other historians who disagree with him. He's one of the historians who are trying to come from the angle that biz big business was not responsible for the Nazis. That's his thesis. That's what he's working with. And even if we agree with that oh, thesis... Oh, so you're, your argument is just what, like... What well, you, you know, said about, the, what you said about yeah, big business not supporting him in the elections is just wrong. No, you, what you said doesn't contradict it. It said that he had no support for the election, and then they helped them consolidate which, power. Which election? After he got which election? Elected. I agree. I kind of want to move this topic. Uh, for, listen, like, I, I agree. Biden has kind of has kind of has kind of major zero support the before the election in 32. <laughs> but by 33, he has good point. support. Do you want me to quote again? Big business support was virtually zero prior to the election of 1933. Uh, That's from Turner in his conclusion. Just uh, ligamite. But, just, but just after ligamite, uh, okay, but after 1933, it changes. When he's in power, they yeah, the capitalists. When he's in power, they're like shit. Hitler's in power. You know, we better but not. They, they were instrumental in consolidating that power. Is the point? All yeah, right, now he didn't want to didn't want to get thrown in a concentration camp like he did to Thyssen. By the way, no, we're gonna take he, some no because his power was not consolidated by then. We're so he wasn't even consolidated at that point. That's what you're not understanding here. They didn't have to help him consolidate. Well, like this his just power. blows out the theory. Uh, he, had, he had a lot of dudes trained to throw people at in jail point, and shoot they people. They could at have him. worked to get rid of Hitler. And by the way, I'm just going off of your source. I'm not even going. Uh, from sources that okay. Well, if you want to accept that source, you'll have to accept his conclusion that big business had virtually well, I'm just saying no role it, it in the Nazis coming anyone. to power. And that's what I'm contesting. I'm not contesting that they supported him when they came to power. I'm saying the communist idea that this was somehow he, he did not uh, fully have This is so much more boring. Power. Listen, man, here's a really interesting point. Do you want to hear an interesting point? Okay, this is like this argument. Of like, this did they fund them at this way. point? Does this matter? Okay, all right. Do you know how? Okay, so all of that's the material historical reality. Yes, this is material historical. Intelligence agencies are the most important thing for a country. Okay, so how are you going to do like the, the Anglo intelligence was secretly pulling the strings of everything? It wasn't secret. That's where the term double agent comes from. Literally, why do you think that the British had all of Nazi communications throughout the entirety of the war decrypted the entire time? So if there they were controlled in Germany, why did Germany go to war with Britain and start like bombing British cities? Uh, the British actually, they actually fucked up super hard when they were trying to bomb London because the British had so infiltrated German intelligence that they fed them wrong answer. Like they told them that the, their missiles were landing in the wrong place. They had all of their sources telling them this. So they actually directed the V2 rockets to miss London from London the entire okay, fucking yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, they had like good intelligence on Germany. Mean so how did that, why them. did that happen? Why was that possible to happen in this state? Like why were the people, the intelligence agents, not loyal to Hitler? Um, hold on, I have a question for Keith. So, in the spring of 1932, uh, Krupp and IG Farben bailed the Nazi party out of bankruptcy. Is this true or not? That's the first I've heard of it. I didn't encounter well, it. Your, your source said that in the spring of 1932, that uh, industrial support or the support by big businesses was at a high, and then later in 32, it went down. So, it would be consistent with what you quoted from your own source. Yeah, but he also say he also says only true growth distortion can big business be afforded a major role in the downfall. Because of the that's his narrative. That's his specific narrative as a historian. He's not the only historian. It's not the only narrative. So let's just also, stick like to the that one well, there's, like, there's another one. There's another book called Who Financed Hitler that has the same conclusion. Okay, well, there's a lot, um, of, about a lot of dick things. was probably like but, but four inches. See, you, have, you have to understand that ideologically speaking, it is in your interest to find sources that support your ideological position. So these are but not that's, the that's only... like the authoritative book on this. He's like one of the most respected uh, historians of the 20th century. Bro. I can give you Who Financed Hitler by Suzanne Listen, Poole either. The, my, the question is, my question is, what is the fucking point of defending these loser regimes that fucking failed when there's actually like winning regimes that you say you see like some elements of things that you would want in? For yeah, instance, China, China is winning because it's so, a fascist so regime. It's a that's retarded because fascists fascism. lose. Fascists always lose. So how the fuck are they fascists? Or unless you're saying that they're going to lose because we're, I mean, Joe Biden's calling them fascists. Now, what is so that? You wait, agree wait. with our national security chief. Wait, like, wh why? What's the point of that? Like, what are you accomplishing by defending fascism? What is the point? Like, they're, they lost. It, it's a failed, it failed. 
It's not a, well, it's not like, a project. Listen, this, 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 this is the before... accomplishment. It's just like that. Uh, this like this like distinction is pretty murky like it's not like as uh it's it's not a very hard and fast distinction when you look at uh, historical contingency you can explain the differences between these regimes rather than looking at it through the lens of ideology so and the lens of ideology did, it's 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 uh it's why retarded. did the german like, intelligence why, why, why did the german intelligence services collaborate with the british so is there like some kind of like you know big structural reason for that? I mean, that seems like some kind of contingent historical kind of. No, but BS, why did they like, do it? Okay. It's just contingent. I mean, that didn't happen in other cases. I mean, the German. It's not. It didn't happen the other way around. The, what the point German intelligence. No, I'm saying. I'm asking you. What What is your explanation for that? Are they are you aware of like major collaboration between the intelligence services? Oh, you aren't. Services? Well, maybe know, you should I know read about the British intelligence services at the time because it's actually extremely important. Yeah, I know they were tracking a lot of German communications. About and, like, they made great advances in like intercepting German communication, but no, they flipped. I mean, they had they had great advances in human intelligence. Okay, so if, if England was direct in Germany, why social... did Germany go to war with Britain in a war that bankrupt Britain and like ended the British Empire? Um, I mean, that's, that's a really long, complicated question. We can talk about it in stages. Because yeah, I'm sure, like, you, I'm sure you got a super big really brand answer that would take forever to explain. I mean, I mean, you should listen to you should listen to some of the stuff we put out on the Sudcast because we go really deep into this shit because it's fucking really complicated. Like, I don't know, man. It's I've not seen just that simple. I'm too transphobic for the Sudcast, unfortunately. Whatever, guys. But I'm saying you, can't, <laughs> you actually can't explain your your hermeneutic of this. Can't explain why the British intelligence agencies were able to flip all of these people in the German intelligence agencies. And the reason why is because a lot of the people in the German intelligence agencies came from that landed class, that landed like old regime class, and a lot of them had really great relations because, again, like the hereditary era aristocracy is not a national phenomenon it's a global phenomenon uh, I think, all of these people like i think like, like the, we're pretty fine with it i mean at least i am fine with acknowledging that hitler was not like the greatest statements statesman of all time he was no caesar he was no that's, stalin that's what, you know what i mean you can put that lightly that's yeah 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 I mean, he was he like a sucked yeah, yeah, he wasn't. He, he he was a you know he was a good public speaker or whatever. He was a charismatic individual, but like yeah, he wasn't as uh, he wasn't like a strategic genius, like yeah, some of these other really, figures. It was really how, like, how do you pretty much all fascists were really shitty yeah. at actually yeah, how do you explain states, the, they all um, failed. Like, I, think I think Hitler and Mussolini, like, they're kind of like, there's, there's like some decent evidence, that, like, definitely with Mussolini, and some evidence with Hitler that they kind of started out as feds, and then they just, like, their psyop just was too successful, and then they were like, sweet, like, let's just keep doing this, you know, and like, just, yeah, that's, and, and because their power never came from the people, <laughs> they were immediately taken out by the people who put them into power in the first place. So that's why. Immediately, it's well, there was a war in between that cost, like, millions of lives <laughs> I mean, for the British Empire, but what uh, that was was an opportunity an to read about. Did not destroy was, the was. British Empire. I it think. did. I mean, the British, the British Empire was Empire. bankrupt by the war. Yeah, but what destroyed the British Empire specifically was um, the triumph of the Soviet Union and the ability for the Soviet Union to help. Yeah, which is the result support. of the war. Which yeah, supposedly, which supposedly yeah, they the were Soviet, directed. And that's so they directed of this whole thing to end up in a way that because would destroy we, the British Empire. But, but you have to understand if you have, if you have, if you have a dialectic perspective, these are the ironies of history. That you know you can act on behalf of your own interests, and this can at same at the same time be the source of your very own. Uh, demise of these yeah, same interests. it's almost like when american fascists like go out to have like a rally in their own interests and then what it does is it's like the worst scandal for them of all time like in recent so like years the, it's so totally like the, destroyed so like your argument is like britain directed the whole thing because there were a lot of spies that were like turncoats and they orchestrated like the entirety of the war and for germany to go to war with britain and like take loads of british lives and bankrupt no, the british empire simple. and have the soviet union wins and that would destroy the british empire so a few things about the soviet union throughout the course of the war so by the time that it became clear so the real position of um, the Allies when Germany invaded the Soviet Union was let's just have hands off and see what's going to happen because they were really betting that maybe Germany is going to eliminate the Soviet Union. They were completely fine with that. Now, when the Soviets proved that by their own it's initiative, we're still at war with Germany. Yeah, but 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 at the same time, they were conducting secret negotiations with the Germans about coming to uh, truce. No, they turned Maybe they the turned down like ten peace offers from Hitler. But they were still yeah, because actually that was a British the Nazis intelligence in secret. They actually and, uh, had people they, tell they were refusing Hitler to open up a second that, that would be possible uh, consistently. And then curiously, immediately in the aftermath of the war, 
You have the development of Operation Unthinkable, which was a plan that by 1956 or 57, I forget which date, they were actually going to engage in a preemptive nuclear strike, killing 80 million um, uh, civilians in the Soviet Union, effectively um, accomplishing yeah, the Nazi Churchill, plan won, of Churchill wanted Austin. to drop nukes on Soviet Union right after the Second yeah, World so War. Yeah, so did Bertrand Russell. Yeah, the, yeah, the Soviets and, wanted to nuke China, and Nixon said no. So you know, I think I think you know, it, it's like you have <laughs> yeah. to be very careful about this idea <laughs> that just because they are the allies, that means that they are serving each other's interests. Because for no, example, I don't believe that. I mean, of course, yeah, Britain yeah. and America and the Soviet Union. Yeah, it's not like yeah, it's like ISIS, right? Russia and America are. Are both fighting. Although we know America funds them behind the scenes, but they're both it's fighting. Chessboard. But that yeah, I'm not disagreeing with this. I'm just like it's a game of idea that Britain was like pulling the strings to destroy its empire for some greater. This is like I think I think no 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 I think no 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 America was the re listen listen I'm okay so America and Britain were competing. The real war in World War II is between America and Britain. Frankly, it's like sounds really counterintuitive, but when you get down to it, that's really what it was all about because they like. The other countries didn't have a fucking chance, man. Like, it's not even, like, it's not even close. I don't know, man. I mean, I the Germans are, like, that 20 miles sense. outside Moscow. That, that makes sense. You know, I'll explain how this can be you understood. Instead of thinking Britain as a monolith of an interest, you have to understand there's a struggle going on within Britain, which is between the kind of old ancient regime, the monarchy, and the, these kind of people, this old money kind of uh, classes. And then you have, I guess, this new kind of national petty bourgeoisie and this new bourgeoisie within Britain. And the, the latter one, I think, is more aligned with America. The former one is secretly... Uh, somehow connected to the Nazis. I don't know all the details of it, but there are really weird things. Like, for the example, royal family, have, have like, you seen with, the footage of the British royal family, the kids? They're doing the, the Hitler salute in the, in the 30s, the middle of the 30s. It's they're like, all they're the Why did they turn down like, multiple yeah. peace offers from Germany where they were going to like take their armies out because of the Because those, peace, are, those peace, that the idea of an Anglo-German peace, as I said, was a specific plot of the British intelligence agencies because they wanted Hitler to not like do, put as much effort into that side of the front, believing that there would be a possible then, offer. Why did, they, why did they turn and them that's when we And inf- that's when they invaded. They well, turned he, them down the because they set them up. The, Germany's the credibility as far as honoring treaties and peace treaties is concerned was thrown out the window in, in many several instances. So they already appeased Hitler um, by giving him Czechoslovakia. He went back on his treaties with them when he invaded yeah, but- Poland. You've already said that and Hitler then, was like no threat to Britain. Like if there um, wasn't in their national yeah. interest to like destroy their empire over. No, like, they wanted the to re- they Poland. wanted to reconstruct the global economy. Right? Yeah, That's there there is really a contradiction here. The British Empire by this time is on its way out because of America. So you have reactionary classes within Britain who represent the reaction of the British Empire against this new development. No, they could have maintained the empire longer without the Second World them War and the Nazis. They could have maintained it longer without the Second World War. It, it bankrupted them. I mean, the, 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 the Roosevelt was, was sent was a ship to take the last... They of wanted the what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it was not in the interests of all of Britain that to, re- to be this force of reaction in the face of this dissolving uh, empire, this empire that is clearly uh, on, on its way out, on the decline, this new U.S.-led world order, which was based on, formally speaking, we know that's not the reality, kind of like national self-determination and sovereignty and the League of Nations and things like that. This was upsetting the former European colonial order. Um, after World War One. the whole order was pretty much um, threatened. Uh, that's why, for example, uh, the American response to the Italian invasion of Ethiopia was so uh, one of such like shock and repulsion for that reason. They just the American led global order and the American vision for world order was not like directly this form of colonization and this direct form of uh, the old. It represented the yeah. old way of things, which is why eyes. Churchill Churchill hated Stalin, whereas FDR and Stalin got along pretty swimmingly. So you can see yeah. a lot of like America actually supported the USSR and China at the time, right? Like we were over there helping. Like this is why Mao has like such a positive view of America at the time, and this is like so counterintuitive to the way people understand the Cold War and shit like this later. But really. The, they were like, like Mao was like directly inspired by like George Washington. And I, I wanted to get to this from way long ago, but you said the three represents came from Mussolini, but that's false. It is origins are in Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg address. Yeah. I feel like we're getting a bit sidetracked with this stuff. 
It's not sidetracked. This is a t- history that almost no one talks about or knows about because who the fuck, like, who's it useful for? It's not really that useful, but I find it personally very interesting because uh, I do think that um, uh, China, like, they've taken a lot from America, and uh, in, th- in a lot of ways, they resemble the old American order far more than um, our current order does. Can I just ask, like, just back to China, I mean, this is, like, the basic question. Like, if China is moving more towards nationalism, more towards racialism, more towards having these uh, various no. classes, more towards the American system. Why, why? But why should we believe that, like, eventually they're just going to, like, abolish the state? No, no, no. Like, I think this is the communism. communism. There's, there's, there's no abolish, abolish, yeah, yeah. abolition of the state is a total No, no, hold on. The communist yeah. society is a No, 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 wait, wait. There is something society. to clarify. You disagree with that? That's, that's important. Is that... Like, Logo, you defend the state. Like, you're no, 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 on with anarchists on Twitter. Communism isn't... That, does, that isn't... No, no, I, I think it's important to talk about Chinese nationalism, and there's a crucial difference here. So German and Italian nationalism re- relevant to fascism was based on the nation state, which was from the 19th century French Revolution and so on. That's where it came from. The Chinese uh, nationalism, I don't know if you can call it nationalism in the same sense, because there is such a thing as Han nationalism within China. And Han nationalism is actually hostile to the Communist Party. Chinese nationalism is about the thousands of year old polity culminating in the Qing dynasty, which is multi-ethnic and in the European sense of the word, multinational. It's multicultural and multilingual and multi-religious and so on and so on, but it's still a central unified civilization. So China is not a nation state, it's a civilization state. So when people are referring to Chinese nationalism, they're referring to the enthusiasm and the veneration and Chinese the honoring. Chinese patriotism. Yeah, it's, well, a, I, I it's have, more kind of patriotism. I have and an then, academic paper, you can take this for Whatever, but I mean, they, they study this question. It's called racial nationalism and China's external behavior. And it says the effort to build racial nationalism is deepening. In developing it, the regime yeah. has moved beyond is, state-centered our, patriotism to a racialized version of nation-centered patriotism. I, I don't. What this do you mean our, by racialized? This is our propaganda. This they're is against our propaganda Han nationalism. because this, in China, Han nationalism see, was a trend, and it was hostile to the Communist Party. And they're, they're, this is the avant-garde of defense of the American-led international order, which is using, like, Jay Sakai, settler colonial stuff to call... It's basically what you guys are doing, no, in a sense. The opposition, saying, the opposition to the American but order but is nationalism. You're actually... Like it's, fe- no, it's, it's not. the things no, that you as no, Marxists deconstruct, no, like no, faith, family, not. folk. No, it's That's not. like the opposition to neocolonialism. The age of nationalism, the age of nationalism is over. There's no Listen, there's I'll concede. Like, Amazon, Amazon is like diversifying the workplace to reduce. No, no, no. Here, here's how here's how I would phrase things, right? I get what you're trying to say. There's clearly a dichotomy between American unipolar globalism and countries, nations, and civilizations attempting to go their own way and um, have some kind of self determination and sovereignty. That that is a very clear distinction, and I understand that. But you just have to be careful to understand that nationalism doesn't mean the same thing as it meant in the 19th century and in the, the 20s relevant to fascism in, in Germany because um, the country... Well, according to you, need it as Marxism or socialism or all these words. They all, the, well, I, I, I don't know. Like, you gotta, you got you to respect the dialectic, Pan. Well, yeah, you really do because um, yeah. there's nowhere in Marxism <laughs> or Marxism-Leninism, according to which the reality of nations is not acknowledged. Or um, so the idea. Yeah, but is, they're meant to dissipate for a global proletarian. No, well, revolution. no, not necessarily. No, I mean, if they no, it, that's not true. The whole point is that you can't make the nation an idol because nations change. Now, granted. They don't change voluntarily. They change at a scale of hundreds or maybe Yeah, but Marx doesn't recognize that the nation state is an expression of this ethnic tribalism. It's an extension of family. The nation state yeah, no. is the result of modernity. It doesn't actually reflect the underlying, like, actual reality. Yeah, but you can have, beyond. like, ethnic tribalism reflected in a nation state. If, if you read Engels' work on the matter, because you're talking about tribes and stuff, Engels points out how the development of the state emerges from family, tribe, gens, and so on. So he traces that specific development, but it's not something you can... You can't universalize tribes across the history of... Um, humanity. It's kind of nonsensical. Yeah, but I mean, your project is like to dismantle these barriers. No, absolutely not. No. Socialism in one country proves that Marxism was never... That's Trotsky. But it's meant to be a temporary phase, isn't it? I mean, no, no, eventually, no, no. eventually you're meant the, to get the global no, proletarian no, no, no. revolution. The, the idea I mean, this was Lenin's that, criticism of Sun Yat-sen. He said that this idea that you could have proper socialism by focusing on land reform and uh, class collaboration and industrial production. He that was not the content of his... Objective socialists, he called it. 
No, which is just the, like what China's the, doing the now. Point, they're honoring the, Sun Yat-sen the, the, as like the, one of their preachers. The meaning of Marxism in relation to different nations and civilizations is that through the imminent development of each nation and each civilization on its own terms and based on its own character, um, the uh, this is the basis of the universal humanity relevant to communism. Now, Trotskyism adopts the view that is inherited from liberalism and anarchism, and actually, uh, more controversially, I will claim Trotskyism has a similarity with fascism in a sense in its conception of universality. The Trotskyist view is a more top-down view of uh, universalism, which does amount to liquidationism and the dissolution of nations and class coming at the expense of which nations. Which is why neocons are Trotskyites. Yeah, as early as Marx, we see that the the idea idea in Marx's critique of the Gotha program, the idea is that the, cla- the content is the class struggle, but the form is national. So the idea for socialist realism uh, under the Soviet Union and Stalin is that it's socialist in content, national. Yeah, yeah but it's ultimately mon- meant to be like a temporary form. You know, eventually you're no. not meant to lose sight of the, the global aspect. No, of global there's no, no, there is no, you're not meant to you're thinking in state. Trotsky terms. The, this, this is no, the this problem. is like straight from Marx. I mean, Marx advocated no, free not. trade to like Keith, the issue, the issue with, um, states. The issue with this idea is that it doesn't have a dialectical form. So this idea of like a universal global community that has no content. Like, what does that look like? What what is its determinate quality? Right? It's a complete yeah, agree, abstract negation. But this is like the this is the, this is the Marxist fantasy of no. Like, this is a Trotskyist fantasy of um, of what Kegel would call bad infinity. It's undialectical and it has nothing to do with Marx, Lenin, Stalin. It's, and so it's on. understandable that you would take this to be the case because a lot of Western Marxists say this and shit. But Western Marxists are all Trotskyists. Yeah, and they're absolutely. mostly liberals. They're primarily liberals. They're yeah. not fucking real. Yeah. And that, they would that's call, why, they would, for example, they would actually agree with you and they would yeah. say, "You're right. China is." fascist like you actually are closer in this sense Th- that's why i think things. things that when it comes to the real experience of marxism there has been a mistranslation to the west and that in the west my thesis is that to understand yeah, but it's a deviation from marx what what's the deviation uh, that you know socialism in one country is no kind of permanent absolutely form. not it absolutely no, is. The deviation from Marx was the Western Marxist. I mean, he thought. advocated free trade for smaller nations, so like to accelerate no, like Marx this merely, in these Marx was a thinker of ironies, and he pointed out the irony of the fact that free trade, specifically in the case of India, would hasten the collapse of uh, capitalism. So this is one of his uh, ironies. Yeah, he, Al- he advocated it in a lot of cases. For but not in every nations. case. In other cases, for example, not in an absolute to, sense, when it's it came to the decline of the free trade system, which was emerging because of people like Lincoln. It's very clear which side Marx took that, that Lincoln's protectionism was more his. Yeah, like he, he didn't advocate free trade for Ireland, for example, because he thought that they could industrially develop by uh, separating from Britain. But again, like the yeah. end goal is that eventually you develop productive forces to such a capacity that you know the contradictions inherent in capitalism that you're moving to a global proletarian revolution. I mean, this is like the first time that's, I've ever heard this from America. No, 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 no. like, that's just the this essence. Is, it has no form. So, wait, no, how are, how are nation no, states, like, how are nations going to exist, like, in communism? Because, you know, that's going to According create, to like, the development of their own imminent laws and reality. So, class struggle is content, it's not form. It doesn't say anything about what the form is going to be. How are you going to have a stateless society if nation states are still existing? Or, I mean, are you denying that, like, classless, stateless society is, like, that's like the whole thing of communism. The state, the yeah, but you have to understand how the state dissolves and what that means. So the state dissolving doesn't mean like all distinctions and intelligible differences and differentiations disappear. It means that their no government no longer rules over the people at their expense, like as a kind of alien interest from the people. It just becomes the administration of things, and that people, as Marx put it find their unity in the development of the scientific and aesthetic um, cultivation and sense. Well, basically, the idea is that the things that unify people remain, but they become sublated in other common points of uh, unity. Like, for example... Why, why does every, why does every Nazis nice. encounter, like, oppose... You don't call it nationalism if you're going to, like, associate that with, like, romantic nationalism, but, like, oppose ethnic tribalism. Because eth- ethnic tribalism, I, I guess, is, as far as I know what this means, is a invention of modernity it's not something that tribalism is an invention of modernity no 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 i come from a tribalistic kind of uh, my I, my family comes from a tribalistic society like have you read the old testament like the jews yeah yeah i understand like i come from tribalist. a tribalistic culture so i understand but it's not this um idealized version of ethnic tribes and this eternal law like 
tribes should be understood uh, from maybe a sociological, psychoanalytic sense. They're a real thing, but the, yeah, like, Marxists example, deny what, what like the right of these America? people to have I, I don't see tribe space. in America. For example, I, I know tribes in, in Lebanon and so on, where my family comes from. So I understand tribes, but I live in America. I don't see tribes here. What tribes are you talking about? Well, I mean, ethnic groups. It's like an extent. They're not tribes. They're, they may like un- in prison. They might stick together as a point, like unify with each other, but they don't function as tribes. So, yeah, so basically, I mean, you think like ethnic nationalism is some kind of false consciousness developed by modernity. I mean, you know, like I, Irish I nationalism, think e- for example, goes back like literally only thousands seems, of years. Ethnic nationalism, uh, yeah, ethno nationalism is inherently a result of liberal modernity. That's why in no, Russia, and it's, in its current state, in its Westphalian state form. Well, let me ask you a like question: How come the ethno nationalists? How come the ethno nationalists in Russia are allied with the liberals? I don't really see your point. Well, mm. because they represent the same form of the decaying Western modernity and the subjectivity proper to Western. Yeah, modernity. I mean, there's a lot of nationalists that are attached to, like, you know, and Ukraine, dead, dead Ukraine, political Ukrainians. Points. There's are a lot of nationalists with like horrible ideas. You know, there's nationalists that claim to support capitalism, well, but it, just, the point, the more principle of like that they align with right nationalism is liberal. It's inherently liberal. Yeah. Well, that's why it's a liberal word, idea. Tribalism. I mean, it, it predates. Yeah. It predates like. There's nothing more like human than tribalism. It predates liberalism. There's nothing like, inherent to uh, racial identity that forces it into like a particular uh, ideology like this. I don't see how that makes so sense. So for most of human history, so like, I, yeah. So say for example, you have a country that um, is like ethnically homogenous, like uh, say Japan, for example, uh, or something. Um, now, if they were to have uh, some kind of socialist reforms uh, or, or what have you. Why would they all of a sudden stop being ethnically homogenous? Like that wouldn't make any fucking sense, right? So, well, so I mean, um, I, I don't know why they would. St- I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like it's the, yeah. So, the, so, the so, point, so they so they inherently the, the liberal because they want Japan, to stay ethnically yeah, homogenous. Yeah, but like, the reason why Japan is ethnically homogenous is because the Japanese people correspond to a specific civilization and a specific history. But if you look at how they came to be, you see that it's a mishmash between different groups and countries. Yeah, ethnogenesis is a thing. Obviously, eth- yeah, all yeah, ethnicities yeah. are produced so, somehow. It's so, a so I would say that in, in the future, like hundreds of years from now, uh, races, or I don't know what you mean, uh, people who look alike, I guess is what you mean, they would change according to the imminent laws governing the development. No, races. There's a difference between ethnicity and race. I, I just yeah, don't I mean, necessarily like, know what you So what? I, I want to yeah. preserve ecological diversity. Like, I want to preserve Irish people. Like, why? Like, like why? So people are wildlife in this sense. And it's no, like no, no, I, I, no, no. Listen, I agree with you. There is something about Irish people that other people do not have. They have something other people don't. They have a unique okay, character. So like, what, what is liberal? There's also about, more like, of Irish them here. Yeah, yeah. But freely why? that doesn't, that doesn't mean one has to be an ethno nationalist. It just means you have to be true to the essence of what you are. And the essence of what you are is not always. Well, I mean, if your country is like point. getting flooded with like uh, you know thin, other groups Irish. that are like miscegenating and so on well like that kind of is you know are we allowed to say the n-word on killstream um, uh, if, if, if thin, Irish. Irish. So, so when it comes to the issue of immigration <laughs> uh, and so on this is an issue of the sovereign state so ireland's part of the eu and it follows the eu's laws uh, it's not you know um it's as simple as that. But the thing is, is that uh, immigration is probably going to be an inevitability in this unprecedented uh, interconnected world and so on. The thing is not, the choice is not between maintaining. It know, it does, but it, there's no reason why it has to be. It doesn't have to be. Like, you, you, like why kind of, if, if like, I just gave you like, the example you're of Japan. Like, you're yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Because, because uh, I agree, mass immigration has been a disaster in Europe. It's been a disaster. But I think the reason it's a it disaster does. is not because of inherent uh, ethno or racial realities. It's because there are clearly different cultural and civilizational qualities. I don't know. This, this is a pretty inherent. Uh, like, uh, on part of both of of, uh, the groups, there is a clear civilizational and <laughs> cultural uh, difference. Well, look, has. I mean, and, uh, and, <laughs> under, and under liberalism, this is what I'm just trying to say. Under liberalism, there is no acknowledgement of this difference. In liberalism, everyone is the same, and yet these differences persist. Under communism, it's always been the experience okay, that but has. Even different if, even people's if, even differences if... can be acknowledged and some kind of authentic encounter and dialogue and exchange can be possible. 
Okay, but even if these like cultural differences are a product of liberalism and it did dissipate or whatever, what if I no, still no, no, like want my group to continue? Okay, I'm but what if I liberalism does not acknowledge these differences? I'm not saying liberalism created them. I'm saying liberalism. Okay, yeah, not I agree with that. To acknowledge them, but another way of not acknowledging. But then why, why are you opposed? Like, if we acknowledge these differences to like people choosing to because what because this is the point of the kind of new Chinese view of a bilateral and multilateral cooperation, win-win agreement, because you can at the same time acknowledge you are different and then also on the basis of acknowledging this the mutual understanding we are different and we're not the same you can still have a mutual contact and a mutual dialogue and a mutual exchange okay. where you okay. can um you don't yeah, well, have to have a neurotic view that you must what if we don't want to can we yeah, acknowledge like, I, that I, we're I, different I, I, and like we're gonna live separately and like, like only my family live in my different. house you, you but should, like i can still be friends with other people no no but it's, like it's, but, they can't but just maybe move in. through the maybe through the course of this dialectic this imminent development and this is true for the history of all civilization especially countries like china Maybe it will happen that a fusion can happen, and that somehow yeah, maybe they we find don't want that. Ground. Maybe we don't want that. Why does that have to be like for some people? I but don't at that point, reason. when you you don't know even know what that would be like, though, because right now in liberalism, okay, but I don't I don't want to like risk it. I don't want to try it. Like I'm happy with like you know my try. Well, like, that's, that's, that's why we encounter other right people is, and we can like share Ireland recipes right and listen, listen. What then you it? are just raising your background as an idol for its own sake, regardless of its content, because no, like you put your family before other people. Like no, no, I agree with your... you. I agree with you. There, but but here's the thing: you don't have incest, right? You have your yeah, family, but, and then. But if I if I go to Ireland in like thirty years, and like it's just full of like, and, uh, <laughs> like people that aren't Irish, but they have like a weird kind of pseudo Irish accent, well, and they're like the top of the morning to you, and Hold on, I'm gonna be Irish like, what the fuck is this? Like, I, why am I here? Like, it's not the same. So you say you won't get as many tourism dollars, dollars from you. Oh, hold on, this confusion. No, it's is not it about that. It's a certain authenticity to no, no, what that this means. Thing's more important so, than this, like... this confusion and alienation or whatever is a result of liberalism because. Liberalism does not acknowledge no, the yeah, fact that they're there uh, is a result of liberalism. The fact that they're there in the first place is no, a result of this is just neo-colonialism. And you're like you're just scared policy. to assert like ethnic nationalism, so you're just like trying to no. get no, around no, 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 this. This is what I'm trying to say. This is what I'm trying to say. At that point, you are not act you don't actually care about the essence or the content of what Irish people really are. Because that content, as far as form is concerned, is undecided. Maybe through the development of this content, the form can change, right? But if you elevate yeah, the, or maybe the it'll form be like to an idol, room and then like if, having if these you elevate the form to, to, if this, you like, elevate the form to, to make an it work idol, without violence, you are just creating a mythology of the abstract Cartesian subject of the liberal subject. You are betraying the uh, man. You're going to like extreme lengths to say that like people can't like choose to live together without like millions of migrants like coming. Listen, here's the thing. This issue of immigration, again, I said the same thing. In liberalism, no differences are acknowledged. So there's a clear confusion that uh, uh, I'm used to a certain culture, I'm used to certain ways of living, and now I'm confronted with other people who have a very different way of living. Okay, but do, this, do groups have a, a right to a living space? Like, do groups have a right to self-segregate? Uh, groups, uh, what do you mean? Countries have a right to self-determination? Groups, like ethnic groups, you know, like if the Irish want to live amongst Irish people and not encounter uh, these people for whatever great reasons you're saying, I mean, like, are you okay with that? I am not okay with creating a supranational body that's going to force certain policies on a certain uh, country. So if a country pursues this path of development that it wants to be isolationist, like, what do you want me to say? Do you think I think America should <laughs> intervene and uh, attack them? No, of course not. But so, so I can racism still is from cool. a distance, I can still from a distance, not forcing my view on them, say that I disagree with this... Uh, this uh, path. I that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the beauty of self-determination is they don't give a fuck what you think because yeah. it's not you. It's not your country. It's yeah. not you. Okay, so yeah. in Ireland, in Ireland, how, like, how, so, like, what do you think if you were to run, like, a plebiscite right now regarding immigration, how would that go? Do you think that the majority of Irish people actually agree with you? 
Uh, well, the last time we had a vote on uh, birthright citizenship, it was the most popular referendum ever. It was like 92% voted against birthright citizenship. And any time there's polls taken on attitudes to immigration in Europe, it's massively against the policy. There's always a majority. But I, I don't think European, but here's what I, my analysis. I don't think European people do this because they have some notion of ethnic purity. I just think they're shocked and confused. Uh, because of this encounter with uh, uh, people who have a yeah, but that's natural. Why? Why yeah. do you want to like? Because you have a bunch of like well, let's U.S. State Department to these because there, there is no being way because into their brains like twenty four seven. The reason is because they live under a liberal system that does not afford them. No, it's the not like if if uh, if a Somali like if a group of Somalis live next to a group of Finnish people like they're okay. Like it's not because of liberalism that there's like incompatibility. Yeah, so, like, because are in liberalism we are not a- allowed to acknowledge that we are different. That's not it. So, yeah, like, that that is precisely it. We're not allowed to acknowledge we're different, but then uh, the, what, what's the implication of that acknowledgement? The implication is maybe I don't want to live next door to. You know the, what I mean? The acknowledgement is since we are different, and this is our baseline, let's uh, have our own some stations. kind of common uh, encounter, some kind of authentic encounter becomes possible because both are secure in their own. Uh, or what about like we all live uh, in our Authentic own encounter land, can lick my. Just go people. back to Somalia. Yeah, you we know can what encounter mean? Like, in people through like this. You know, the listen, internet this kind like... of racialist uh, pathology is completely. Pathology. How is it pathology? How is it pathology? It's it's pathology. Like normal healthy it's human a behavior. It's a modern meeting perversion. It's a complete. It's literally self. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We got a little the Somalis in. This is what the logic is. We're being like, oh my God, every every civilization has been built based on an authentic, only in modernity. On Somalis. Only so in how many Somalis are in China? Man, I mean, you're literally in like Vosh. Like, this is like, this is like no, Jesus it's a fact. Like, in modernity alone, these only you're in just scared Cartesian, and you just you're only no different in Cartesian modernity do we have people say, we elevate the form of our uh, culture for its own sake. Uh, we will never, ever uh, encounter anyone else this is yeah, a result because the Spartans of modernity. were like, let's get some sub-Saharan Africans. This in is here, incestual know? pathology of modernity. Freud will describe this clearly as a form of incestual pathology. Yeah, of course, all Freud history will. Of like, we, know, we know Freud's before, background. All, like, all history of the most popular kind of porn in Ireland is based on mutual encounter and mutual development between different peoples from different. That doesn't cultures. mean we need to be forced to live together. What do you mean forced to live together? You're uh, not forced to live together now. Yes, it is. Mass immigration is against the democratic will in pretty much every country. Okay, so who's who's pushing mass immigration? Uh, the ruling class, the capitalist okay, elites. Okay, are they it's communists? The, it's, it's, are they the communists? No, I'm an anti-capitalist. They're capitalist elites. This okay. is the new form of neocolonialism, where Listen, instead of settler not, colonialism, so, so, so like, you take the old world into the new world for cheap labor. And, Listen, you know, yeah, exactly, Keith, because, because you're run by place. liberals. Keith, I'll you're tell you, liberals. you, be careful. I yeah, agree we, with you. Yeah, we, 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 I'm not the like, same. Oh, wow. Ireland, oh my God, we didn't we didn't know we were run by liberals. I guess I'm a communist now. I guess I'm a communist sent to Somalia. Let's say Ireland becomes sovereign. Sovereign and leaves the EU, right? Let's just assume this would happen. Sovereign country, self-determination, leaves the EU. Now it's a democratic state. It's going to curb immigration. It's not going to have this mass immigration. Fine. But Ireland now cannot benefit from the exploitation of the countries that people are coming from. Remember, if there's no intervention in Syria, I don't don't want this exploitative neocolonial process. Yeah, so Ireland has to somehow integrate itself in the world order, in the world economy. Otherwise, Ireland's you not going to become You can do that without mass immigration. Autarchic. Countries can have like an integrated world order without mass immigration. Yeah, but China, you still you know have, China still has the lowest to, number I, I of foreign agree, born agree, population listen. of any country in the world. Listen, you are still like, going to have for China to flood if, its if country Ireland with Africans needs something, so they can have this if, if sincere Ireland encounter needs something with from the Africa, other. Africa Ireland must address the countries of Africa and their specific developmental uh, situation. And if that involves exchange of specialists from Ireland, teach uh, Africans with their education how to, uh, so on, teach them uh, engineering and so on, and then Africans come to Ireland to take advantage of um, being able to send money back home for like I am not advocating I am not advocating I'm talking to both. I, I like, don't this advocate is like for, for chaotic you don't want to endorse I don't this thing advocate like for chaotic get you mass immigration by no 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 it's not about I do that. not it's advocate not about that, for man. chaotic mass immigration all I'm saying is that it is pathological to think that there, there must be a preservation like, of a purity the most human expression no kind of Mutual Humans are tribal, like it. It says nothing to do with tribes. Nothing. 
I mean, that's what, like, so, the like, ethnos is. It's just... Uh, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's not. Mass immigration not. is not a communist policy. Mass immigration is not a communist policy. I know. Policy I'm not arguing with that. I'm not, like, one Anti-communist. I know. So, I know. I know. Like I know. Secret, I know. Like, but listen, but I know. Like, I know. I know. I know. But I think it's important to note this, right? Because because this wasn't a democratic thing, right? As you're saying, it's not something people adopted. This is something that has been forced down onto people it, for the in a, in a lot of cases. Um, but that isn't the result of like communists. Like this is the result of liberals. Yeah, so if you want this you to stop, you have to fucking have a actual republic but at the same time yeah you have to hold you back global from that, listen, neocolonial the people, capitalism the people holding you back the only from things that, are that really oppose neoliberalism like the faith, people holding family. you back from that the people holding you back from that are not the immigrants themselves those are not the people yeah, okay. who are keeping you from changing these policies right so when you oh, pathologize well, and you no but when you pathologize <laughs> and you say if we expelled yeah. them if we expelled these immigrants then suddenly everything would be fine and then we would yeah, be that's able just a caricature to straw man straw man like listen the, when, you also, shit, when you like, also oh, dehumanize hold on when you dehumanize immigrants and speak about them, don't dehumanize. Just go be human how, back in your own how country. How dehumanize them? Give me an example of me because of them. this kind of language uh, I'm hearing from Joel and so on. You okay, don't have to disrespect others. Dehumanized. Why disrespect? Why not be human? I haven't dehumanized them. I think that they would be better off in their countries of origin. There's no need to so disrespect. They would say the same, man. They okay, would I'm say not the same. There's no need to disrespect. Why, why they why they come here then? Because okay, where okay, which immigrants are we talking about? Come? If, 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 you, if you if you if you needed to if yeah, you had the opportunity being to help your family <laughs> at home, would you do it? Yeah, I don't blame the individual immigrants. Yeah, Joel, aren't you in America you now? So well, you're like, arguing you know, against the characterization and no disrespect. Joel, aren't you in America now? Like you're Australian. Why are you doing fucking in my country? Get the fuck out of here. What are you doing here? Is that so? What? Okay. I'm are like the you? same. I'm like the same ethnos as you. Me and Joel are against. I don't like, give a shit. Go take a holiday. You're not an American. Okay, well, you, don't, you don't actually appreciate. You don't appreciate America. Ha, have you, have you read the book? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought know, this was Joel, America. Joel, I don't no. give a fuck have about civic identity. Well, man, or <laughs> you you know, I recommend you a book. Read a book called Ethnos and Sociology by Alexander Dugan. He will make it very, very clear. Ethnos. Yeah, Dugan's like Dugan is like on race. Dugan is like if. If a Somali becomes Orthodox Christian, they're Russian, they're you know Russian. what I mean? Yeah, I yes, like, this is what oh, happened. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Pushkin Please. was African. Pushkin was an African yeah, uh, Pushkin was African. from African slaves. African slave came to Russia, became Russian. And there are aristocratic poetry. lineages within Russia descending from this uh, African guy. And he became Russ Russified. And then also the Tatars and the Turks and uh, all sorts, Mongols, all sorts of syncreticism is what defines the modern Russian. The best, yeah, mix the best, uh, the best Soviet also, like, music plenty of was ethnic from uh, groups Koreans. that have endured for thousands yeah. of years that have been quite happy like with their own no, culture. No, for thousands of years, it's only been a continual encounter between different I don't people. know, man. Like the Pashtuns have been around a while. The Jews have been around a while. All of those people are mixed in with others. So, like, we should just, like, mix, like, the whole world together. No, no, no. You don't have to go out of your way to do group. it. No. If it happens naturally, why oppose it? It's not natural. That's what I'm saying. If people like the natural that's state like saying, for people uh, to be that's like tribal. saying marrying someone not in your family isn't natural. It's not like saying that at all. That makes no sense. You're the what one the that's fuck? trying to force the unnatural thing. Like, like no, no like, how am I forcing? Without, without, it? I'm not forcing without liberal, without liberal, liberal propaganda. Like Irish people. This is what you don't Somalis, understand. Like Before liberalism, this was the norm. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, I don't know, man. I mean, doesn't the existence of, like, lots of ethnic groups show that, like, we've been becoming, like, more diversified in terms of, like, splitting off and... Yes, but this also corresponds to mutual encounter between different peoples. It's one and the same dialectic. It's not... This, the diversification and Yeah, I mean, look at what, what is, is the Irish dialect. made up of? What is Irish made up of? Irish, oh, here we you've, go. Got, you've got fucking people with Iberian heritage... You've got the uh, the old Ang like the old like um, Norsemen that were in. The Ireland. thing is, like ethnogenesis. Yeah, right. I guess it's just not African. The million yeah, like, times e over hundreds of years. Ethnogenesis, like you know, the way that it's being done now, there's no possibility of ethnogenesis. Like you, this is like that's like a slow know? organic process. Like if you look at America today, like that. The Vikings have, were slow and organic. <laughs> you have. Uh, like, you guys are just defending this because you're scared. Like this is not a natural. No, position. scared this is, no. this is a modern no. neo-colonial capitalist position, and you're no, I'm opposed to, you're scared. I'm you don't opposed want to get some of the same not. things you are. The modern capitalist no, the position is one which conceives ethnos and nationality as pure forms, which have no, no dialectic. 
No. All this that happens is, is like rusty, con rusty construction. This like all, is all the stuff you're saying about Descartes. like, oh, this is we're all just mix of different Cartesian groups. This is always coming no, from No, it's the being specific. It's being yeah. specific because I don't, there is no white people. Like white people is not a distinct category. You guys are, you it's guys are you're talking about, we're talking about we're ethnicity good. and now you're talking about race. Like these Listen, two liberalism, what liberalism is precisely about? what requires the formal purity of the subject. You are the liberal. Doesn't yeah. make any fucking sense. Like, I guess what do you all, mean? all my ancestors for like thousands of years were like liberals because they had a sense no, of like No, your ancestors are form. mixed with other people's. The, the story of Irish nationalism <laughs> and like Irish republicanism is a very, Keith, very Keith, old Keith, story as you You're would Irish? Know, but no, there wasn't. Irish, yeah, it's right, like it wasn't Irish civic identity. nationalism. Keith, you're, they, you're they were Irish, fighting right? for a country for Irish. Hold on, hold on. Keith, yeah, but Irish The Republicans were fighting for a country for the Irish. You're Irish. Ireland you know, for the Irish. Possibility why shouldn't Connacht be in the Keith, since why you're can't Irish, be you know there's a high right. possibility One my time. ancestors uh, gave birth to yours, the Phoenicians. You know that's like a theory, right? Okay, but like, what is, like, I don't get, like, this isn't some, like, big BTFO, like, groups have mixed through history, okay, like, there's my no extended purity. group there's exists. No for, for, I'm not saying force anything, I'm just saying, if it happens naturally, why be scared? It's not happening naturally, and I'm saying people groups should have the right to resist it. But you're like just a priori against people. No, so no one goes out. You go out and you you meet a nice you meet a nice like Middle Eastern girl who's uh came to came to Ireland. The right? like, Yeah, yeah. You're gonna you're gonna <laughs> stop that for your racial purity, really? Yeah, I want my kids to look like me. What's wrong with that? So so you you really like it's, this girl? She's so great, etc. And then you're gonna you're gonna turn her down because you're gonna say I'm sorry, but I care about my race more than yeah. Listen, no, no, like no, let me, a let genuine me, connection with someone. I want my kids to look like me. No, no, let me be fair because I like people from my background too most of the time, right? But if I meet someone who's not from my background and still uh, satisfies the essence of what I look for someone, then I'm not gonna turn them down just because they're from a different background. It's but if I only turn them down just because they're a different background. I'm betraying the essence of what I am in the name of some uh, idolatrous uh, yeah, form. Yeah, we, we all have, we all have black friends, am, bro. I want my kids to look like me. More I, you know what? You're, you're like, not having kids in the first that. place. Look, look, look. Have, like, I, 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 prefer my kids, I prefer my kids to look like me too, but here's the thing. I am also at the mercy of destiny, at fate. I'm not God. I can't say... Uh, I know uh, what like I am exactly. Destiny. I don't know exactly what who I am and what I am. That's something suspended. In I mean, do reality. you see the lens you're going to? Like, when me and Joel are just like, yeah, groups should be allowed to just like have their own like living spaces and like you know not have to deal with other groups. And like, you're going like to the lens of like. Okay, so you don't want to take Northern Ireland back because this is you the think issue. Fine, this is the issue. Right? Why not leave Ulster? I, Why can't that's exactly Northern the same Ireland? Of, like, of national Italians. sovereignty and self-determination. I don't want anyone to be forced military to do anything, right? But I can still critique this position for, as from a human and moral so on perspective without forcing anything. I can still uh, argue with it and say this is a false path. This is a false path. All right, well, is it immoral if someone wants their children to look like them and just like chooses not to miscegenate? Well, uh, it I occurs think from, uh, from a cultural own, perspective, I don't if care. you want people to look like you, just fuck your siblings. <laughs> yeah. The, the, op terrible <laughs> argument. the optimal, like, uh, like uh, amount of, like, because genetic drift is, is like, I a say cousin this. or something. Because the essence of what you truly are is suspended in reality. You have no formal certainty over what that will look like. None. I don't know. I can, I can pretty much I choose where I want to take my head. Who you are can look like, look like, like something, something you didn't person. expect. That's what I'm trying to well, say. Well, I know if I have a kid with a black person, uh, my, my <laughs> child is going to be less genetically similar to me than like some random Irish person I meet on the street. So what? Uh, so I want my well, children to be genetically similar to me, like this. This is a weird, Why? like, uh, this is like a weird Bill Gates. What's like, weird about this? Is like the most natural, this is like the most you, natural you thing. Sound like a, you sound people like, like not, no one has a, no one sound like a weird more guy. No one with more like empathy for what people who are genetically similar Listen, man, to them, like genetic similarity theory. You're Your talking in the language of modern science to describe ancient and so on primordial realities. It's complete vulgarity. Genetic, what do you mean genetic? Genetic means what? Listen, man, your great grandfather would have been like, "Yeah, I'll marry a Spanish Catholic girl, but no way would I marry a Protestant." Like, yeah, this isn't how people absolutely. fought in history at all. My grandparents were big. Pretty sure Cage would marry a Spanish Catholic girl too. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but so, so like, isn't that a non-genetic? Yeah, scenario? white's all right. You know, I don't know. 
This is so dumb. Anyway. It's so fucking stupid. Listen, I because think what you're really saying is like you're like obsessed with like this eugenics notion that like your genes are superior to other genes so uh, you keep them pure. It's just stupid. But well, not how you're anyone in your family has okay, ever thought so through we, all we have been going very modern like, uh, pathology. Two, well, we've been going for two hours and a half. You I, want I, me to run in? Up let me. I, I gotta, we I can wrap to, it up. Let me run yeah, in the sure. callers real quick, just on a yeah. lightning round type deal, because they haven't waiting a while. If that's okay with everybody, this was a good yeah. shot, by the way. Yeah, and yeah. I just let it go. I completely, basically, just hands off. I, mean, I, was, there I, was, was, kind of, I was kind of hoping Haz would lose his shit, and I could see him and Joe would No, Haz was like really well behaved. I think it's because he respects us. Maybe. There's like a ten- oh, that's kind of yeah, that's people cute. act human to me. I'll act human back. That's what I always say. All right, let's no, like uh, well, I'm human to neocons, so. All right, let's yeah. let's run these guys neocons in. Are I, was, human. I was just hoping for like the shirt off, like alpha male <laughs> yeah. contest. You know? <laughs> uh, Mouse, go ahead. You're on the kill stream. Oh hey, um, I really, really like the show a lot. I thought you guys talked about a lot of interesting things. Um, I do have a few questions for um Keith and Joel though. Um, it seems to me like. Most, uh, at least at the beginning or in the middle of the debate, there's a big, um, the main point of contention was whether or not um, Hitler had uh, rose, rose to power because of the um, industrialist support. Um, I mean, Keith, pretty much, it seemed to me like he was seeding that Hitler was going out of his way at the very least to get the support of these people. And he's, in my opinion, seeded that at least after Hitler rose to power, he had an, an ambiguous support from uh, from these industrialists. So how can he, like in, in good faith, say that the fascist position is somehow anti-capitalist when he, you know, speaks about uh, class collaboration in a positive way? No, I don't think they went out of their way. They got little support and they turned leftward in 32 up to the 33 election. I mean, yeah, there's like a, you know, the party existed for what, like 15 longer years before they got into power. Of course, they're going to like go looking for funding somewhere, but it was largely unsuccessful. Yeah, but them being unsuccessful is not like, you see how that's not really. Yeah, like, but the reason they were unsuccessful is because they didn't like cook on policies and just become like pro capitalist Republicans or something. They like, they were unsuccessful because the industrialists could see that they're interested in the line. So you think that the and what about after they got in power? Do you do you think that they were just like leftist, basically? Is that like your point? Because that's what it sounds like. Well, they, they subjugated capital to the interests of what they considered the social good. So they were socialists. So you're saying you you aren't you like are one hundred percent sure that Hitler fundamentally was not like he didn't cede any ground. You don't think that's true? I think Hitler. I think Hitler was making. I mean, maybe like you know, you could criticize this move or that move, but he was playing the cards that he was dealt, and the cards that he was dealt were very different. He didn't come to power through some social revolution that like completely upended the entire class structure with this giant bureaucratic apparatus and the way that you know Mao came to power. You know what I mean? Like he's in a very different situation, and that was my point from the very beginning, which was uh, that I think you need to take into consideration these uh, other material historical circumstances when analyzing these different states and understanding the states as an uh, states as these autonomous entities that exist in a complex structural strategic environment and marxism is is not like junk to me like there's this interesting insights in marx and in the marxist tradition but uh, i think you need to add some extra elements in there to really like beef up your analysis to be able to make sense of these things and when you do you can kind of see there's a lot. There's a lot in common between the National Socialist, the Fascists, and some of these uh, communist states in terms of some of the goals that they had and what they were dealing with. But they were coming at it from very different angles. They, they, uh, they had very different ways of coming to power, different strategic situations, um, etc. And so, when you take those into consideration, I think ultimately, if Mussolini or Hitler could have cucked the capitalists. Like if they had, if they didn't go to war and everything fell apart and they had some time to like develop the party and I think they would have headed in that direction um, where it would have ended up looking more and more like uh, similar to it, not necessarily how China is today or something, but it would have looked more and more like this kind of 
a kind of like a bureaucracy that basically subordinated capital in, entirely to the state. I mean, and they Hitler, did, Hitler said to generals in the Wolf Slayer in 1944 that he wanted to establish racial unity in Germany by overcoming the capitalist order and working for the construction of a new classless society. That's a quote. Yeah, I mean, he, he did. Like, you look at some of like the like the reforms. Uh, to the economic system in bo- under both Mussolini and Hitler, and you can see they're heading in that direction. They're heading in a socialist direction yeah, from where from a which it was before they China, came to so power. No one can strange. argue against that. And and so you, you know, it's like you got to res- you got to respect the uh, process. You can't expect people to just, it, when you when you come to power, you can't just like arbitrarily just do whatever the fuck you want. Like that's not how sh- shit works in reality. And that's why I was um, that's why I don't come here to say like fuck Stalin, fuck Lenin, fuck Mao. I actually respect all these figures because I understand they were making decisions that made sense based upon the situations that they were in. And so this debate was not so much uh, we're team fascist, your team communist, and we're arguing about our guys are better than your guys. But it was more uh, nuanced than that, at least for me. I wanted to argue yeah. instead, uh, to, to like to kind of uh, get outside of these ideological teams and uh, develop uh, like a more nuanced analysis of this stuff. And I was, see- and, I, and I think um, Marxists have a tendency to be uh, very uncharitable towards fascists. And I think part of the reason why they do that is probably just like smart because they don't want to associate with fascists because they have such a bad reputation. Uh, because, uh, but. Um, you know, it is what it is, but I think it's a good, I think it's productive discourse to have because, um, you know, l- looking at these states, I think tells us a lot about, uh, I mean, that's how you really understand the 20th century really. And also it's like the situation that we're in now in the West, like in the Anglosphere in particular, like we need to look to these states as models for like some signs of how the fuck we progress because clearly, you know, this kind of gay liberal BS like sucks. So uh, these, like you, you can at least, you know, we're not going to copy out of, co- and the lesson that you should take is you can't copy and paste from any of these other states. You have to respect your particular circumstances. All right, I see a super chat here. First worldism says, what's even the disagreement in essence? Uh, he kind of talked about this a minute ago, Joel did though. Uh, reds, browns uh, versus dark reds, neither respect people's liberties and principle of private property. China's yeah. incompetent state, quote, yeah, at abusing, st- at abusing people and Western government now follow their example. Sad. Uh, hey, man, your uh, your audience is full of liberals, Ralph. No. Uh, let's see. Epstein didn't said rescued from the AF high school gang bullying early and Ralph Amell. Let's fucking go. That's right. We did start a little early tonight. Neon Noir says, uh, as you are, well, I won't say what he said, uh, but he, he insulted your um, physiognomy there. And then he said, you sit on Twitch collecting shekels all day. You are communist through and through. He said, okay. Uh, BD says, uh, have stopped coping with the ML crap. Join us. Shout out to New Frontier. Hail Keith. Hail Joel. Hail Victory. Um, let's see. <laughs> Prolific something or another. I won't Do repeat. you guys not feel how cringy and LARPy this is? Yeah, like, so I it's, it's, it's a joke, terrible. man. Just like, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, no, have no. a laugh. It's dude. not a joke, though. I seen tweets like from you from like three years ago where you go on about how great national socialism is, dude. So, like, uh, Ralph, I mean, Ralph, I, mean, I, I think that was only a year or two old. Ron, Ralph, I hate to do but like, I really do. I have a show I gotta be going on soon, but so, like, it's cool. All right, just let me run through. I've I've got most of those. Danny says, if you can see this comment, wink at the camera. Okay, there you go. Um, and then there's a couple more that are, I won't read. Uh, Josh Neal, real quick, let me go through callers just real quick. There's only two more after this. Go ahead, get your point in real quick. If you can hear me. Josh Neal. Mr. Neal. Oh, silent Josh Neal. Silent partner in tonight's episode. I appreciate you listening, though. All right, now let's try another one. <laughs> Big Daddy Matt, go ahead. Hey, what's up, guys? What's up, man? Go ahead, lightning round. Go. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to say... Uh, that uh, watching this, uh, watching Keith and Joel destroy these two uh, losers was like watching an epic IRA bombing compilation. Oh, no, God. You know? <sighs> All right. Uh, I'm telling you, do you, you don't feel like the cringe LARPiness of this? <laughs> like, you seriously find this like really compelling and authentic? All right. I don't know. Um, it seems like that, just like that, that is the old. Well, I don't feel that was, way. Do you feel that way? I feel like we yeah, have a pretty good conversation. Yeah, I think we ended Really? Yeah. Has it okay? Do you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. Which one's talking right you don't now? Sound very Are you low? Well, let's just let the audience decide. All right, Big Daddy Matt, thank you, sir. I appreciate All you right, getting that thanks. in. Thanks, Ross. All right, good. <laughs> 
What in the world? All right, Hollywood Lightning Round, go. Uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Keith. And I know that has, um, you always talk about how you win debates. I just wanted to know, uh, do you think he won this debate as well? Thanks. All right, thank you. Yeah, I think on the substantive points, um, I do feel confident that I got my points across. And yeah, so uh, yeah. Uh, Frastus Theo, go ahead, last caller. Well, I'm, I'll probably do a little bit of kill stream after this. Last caller for these guys. Go ahead. Oh, he's another silent guy. Um, all right, you know what? I'll try Josh Neal. Josh Neal, did you get it fixed real quick? Uh-oh, I heard something. But it wasn't your voice. That's the unfortunate part. All right. Sayonara, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Keith Woods. Thank you, Joel Davis. Uh, thank you, Haz, as well. Thank you, uh, Logo Daedalus. Um, do you guys got anything else you want to say here at the end? No, I had fun. It was cool to talk to Haz for the first time. And Logo was here as well. All right. Yeah, yeah overall, I think it was a productive discussion. <laughs> uh, thankfully, it didn't get ugly, you know, which is nice. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed myself. I had a good time. So, yeah. Well, I had a good time as well, and I want to thank all you gentlemen for coming on, and uh, and I appreciate you uh, coming on the kill stream. Hope to have you back, and uh, stay safe this weekend. It's upcoming weekend. Okay, for sure. All right, see you later. All right, peace out, guys. Bye.